Norton on the Paranormal State Radio Network. That is right, Andrew. This is another night of the Midnight Ocean. (laughs) I don't know how many more we have coming as Matthew bears down on the great state of Florida. But yes, we are still live coming to you from the Nature's Coast. Now, we're on the other side. We're on the Gulf Coast. We got actually, we were the ones that got hit by Hermes. And I can tell you, that was a Category 1. I cannot imagine what a category three or category four is going to be like but the whole state of florida is in emergency mode because now they're saying it is going to swing in a little bit closer to land than expected hopefully well not hopefully but uh it'll make landfall if it makes landfall that would be good news for us if there is any good news in this because now they're saying that if it doesn't make landfall it is going to swing around about north carolina Do a U-turn and come back in and hit us again. So you can't win for losing. But our prayers and and thoughts of safety go out to all of those along the East Coast. My brother actually is in the eye. I talked to him today. And what is he doing? Uh, He's laying tile. (laughs) He's taking the time off to lay a little bit of tile. So, uh, yeah, he's got his generator going. His cars are all filled up with gas. Everything's ready to go. And they're hunkered down. Our in-laws along the coast there are also, now they're on the outer islands. Uh, if you guys are familiar with Daytona area, there's a, a Ormond Beach area, and we're really, really concerned for them. Uh, they've already blocked off the, uh, the bridges that go out to Ormond Beach. They're not allowing anybody to join in. Uh, or to uh, to come in onto the island. So it's one of those things where we'll keep our fingers crossed, prayers, hopefully everything will be okay with them. But uh, as a program note, with we're supposed to be about 40 to 50 mile an hour winds even here on the west coast of the state of Florida. So we don't know. We, you know, just hang hang in there. We'll keep you posted by Facebook if we're going to have a show or not uh, on Thursday and Friday. Because even with those winds, you can imagine we're, we're probably going to have some downed power lines. And because we are not in the direct path, we, we might. They were actually telling us that we might be without power longer than we were with Hermes. Because Matthew's going to hit the metropolitan area of florida all along that coast if you've ever been on the east coast of florida you'll you'll know that it's very very metropolitan and stuff so hopefully everybody will come through this okay and and listen to our governor our governor has asked for a mass evacuation so everybody from the east coast and if you are a listener, I'll, I'll tell you this. If you guys need a place to stay, if you are a listener, reach out to me. Production dot the midnight ocean. Actually, use listener dot the midnight ocean at gmail dot com. We can we can put you up if you're over on that side of the island. Uh, we can help. We got plenty of space. You know, tents. <laughs> we have tents for you, but we'll be glad to help out where. We can. All right. Enough of that. So we got uh, tonight's show. We're going to have Stephanie Osborne on. Looking forward to this. She is the interstellar woman of mystery. And we'll talk about her books and her experiences and things like that. But before we do that, I, I wanted to address a few things, some comments, because we are listener driven. We we love our listeners. And, and one of the things I wanted to do is address some of your comments. And so here we go. This is off of our YouTube page, SB, SBG fan. A great guest, Jeff. Really enjoyed hearing from the doctor. He's talking about Dr. Michael Heiser. I've heard him before on other channels. He's scholarly and believable. I'll be tuning in again more. Well, thank you. Thank you, SBG. Uh, starts, stars are, <laughs> however, writes four hours. Ain't nobody going to listen to that. Well, stars are, I got bad news for you because in January, it, it's a four hour radio show. <laughs> and, after January 1st, it's going to go to five. So I don't know. <laughs> maybe, you know, maybe you need to go back and watch some NFL or something. I don't know. Or whatever you watch. If you watch anything, who knows? Maybe you're a book reader, which more props to you if you are. Uh, Demetheus says, mad props to Jeff Norton for hosting Wall Thornton on his show. Wall is one of my idols and I followed 
his work extensively. And I encourage anyone with a curious mind to check out Thunderbolts.info and their YouTube channel, Thunderbolts Project. The work those people are doing right away is truly revolutionary. Absolutely. And thank you, Demetri. He actually has more comments, but uh, so we can get through these. I'll go through the hairdresser says, I'm now a new subscriber to your show. Found your show after listening to Dr. Ram and Jimmy on Jimmy Church's show. Oh, well, I'll let you know. Dr. Ram's going to be joining us again on Monday. He's coming back in. That's going to be fun. I love him. I love Dr. Dr. Ram. He's incredible. He is just, uh, he's just so entertaining. And, uh, but it is like herding cats and stuff. But I love Dr. Ram. He, he is so fun. He's a guy that I can sit around and just let him, let him listen. I got criticized on my first one. I talked too much. I'll, uh, I'll remember that with him this time. Let him go. But actually he enjoyed it because he said he didn't have to talk that much. <laughs> so it's, it's a balance. It's a balance. Brian Kerr says, I think the electric universe model is better than the standard model. I'm going electric. Yeah, you know, Brian, I am too. I, I kind of believe. I, I am of the belief. But, the, you know, what, what created the planets to begin with? That's now the question that we have is what we're, what put them there. I, I, I do believe that uh, the electric universe is a little bit, makes a little bit more sense to me. I think that, uh, and then John Fulton says, hope. You can have Rob Skiba on sometime. Yep, uh, John, I, Rob, I will let you know. Rob was originally scheduled last week to join us here, and uh, he had some family emergencies that, that came up. I'll let him tell you about that if he sh- so chooses. But we are in talks with him to get him back onto the show here within a week or so. So we will definitely have Rob back on. Uh, Earl Gray talks about uh, interview starts at 30. Yep, Earl, thank you. Yeah, one of the things, guys, we did, if you notice, our interviews actually start at the very beginning of the show, except when I'm doing this. <laughs> but I'm just doing some house house cleaving here, or house cleaving here. Uh, moderator, you have a gift for talk radio. Enjoy your show immensely. Thank you. Sean Holmes, all I got to say is, okay. <laughs> Sean on the uh, on the on the Walt Thorman interview kind of put bull. <laughs> you can finish the rest of it. We we have a policy here that we try not to swear. We try to keep it family. So all I've got to say back to you, Sean, is okay. <laughs> so uh, Brian uh, Mendez, thank you, thank you very much. Um, yeah, it was kind of funny how we were advertising our software and then our our, our system crashed. Uh, Torn leaf. Uh, Thank you for your comments, uh, Brenna Young. Thank you. Uh, of course, the Underground Resistance Network, they're on there quite a bit in the chat room. So thanks once again. Uh, Mod Speak, uh, Mod Speak, you know, yeah, I, there's some, some agree. I agree with you and I disagree with you. So there's a lot of chat. So get out there, guys, in the chat room. We'll try to acknowledge those a little bit better, uh, in uh, the future. So. As promised, we want to uh, go ahead and cue this up. So we got Stephanie is going to hopefully be joining us here in a minute. So, yep, I see her there on the YouTube line. So let me give you guys a little bit of a background here, a little backstory on Stephanie. A uh, few, um, uh, you know, I got to drink my my Tim Horton. You know, I reached out to Tim's to see if they had a different style because there's no reason why they can't have the logo but tim horton's coffee the best inexpensive coffee the working man's coffee that you'll ever drink if you're within 500 miles of a tim horton's i highly recommend that you take the detour and you get out there and you get yourself a dark roast with a danish good stuff good stuff and no they don't they don't pay to advertise i I, it's a self-endorsement i just love their product so our guest tonight, Stephanie Osborne, few can claim that v- the varied background of Stephanie Osborne, the interstellar woman of mystery, veteran of more than 20 years in the civilian space program, as well as various military space defense programs. She worked on numerous space shuttle flights in the International Space Station and counts the training of astronauts on her resume. Her space experience also includes space lab and the ISS operations, variable star, astrophysics, Martian, alien geophysics, r- radiation physics, nuclear, biological, and chemical weapons effects. 
There now there is a resume that most people I can honestly say Stephanie will never obtain. <laughs> well, it it took a while. I'll admit it took a while to get there, but yeah, that's that's it. And 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 guys, so you guys know that's just half of her. That's just half of her bio. There's still more here, but I figure she can probably tell tell the stories better than than me just reading it off of a page. How did you? I mean, all right. So let's just start out from the very beginning. How did you seek out this? Field? I mean, were you always a kid that looked at the stars? Kind of like in, you know, in, in, uh, with the cosmos and just, and, and said, you know, I, I, I want to be in, in this business. Pretty much. Yeah. Is that how it works? Um, when, when I was a kid, uh, very, I'm very, very, very small. I'm giving away my age here. Uh, I'm, I'm older than most people think I am to look at me. Um, when I was very small, uh, two very important things happened. Yeah. One was the Apollo fire. Uh-huh. I was I was just barely old enough to understand what happened, but I did understand what happened because I was a little bit on the precocious side. Very the other the other thing that that happened was and and you'll laugh at this, okay? A certain television program called Star Trek started airing. Now my little kid brain watched Star Trek, and it said, this is the way it might be one of these days. And then I looked at the tragedy, and I said, this is what's happening right now. These guys were trying to get from here to there, and they were willing to die for it. I want to help. Little kid brain, you know, and and, and from then on, my... My education from elementary school was focused on working in the space program. Mm. You know, my, I grew up, my brother, so you know, my brother's actually, uh, he, well, he, he no longer is in the space. And he got out. <laughs> he said he couldn't do it I, for whatever reason. But he, you know, he got his uh, graduate degree at the University of Tennessee Space Institute and worked on propulsions and all that for various companies and, and, and everything. And so I grew up with him and he was kind of the same way, you know, we grew up with Star Trek, Star Wars. And, and I actually, I, you know, it's kind of, I consider you guys kind of like nerd people that go into the business, um, to help people. I think Chris, you know, my old, my my brother, he's the same way. I think he got into it because he was fascinated uh by it, but also he wanted to participate. He wanted to be part of of that you know, unknown frontier. And yes. and and so and so I kind of had a jilted experience because I I heard all of the kind of inside stories of what was going on and you know, most of America don't they just don't realize Space is hard. It's not easy. Oh yeah. <laughs> it's and 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 if you screw up, you're dead. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and there's so many things Tw- that can screw. What was that classic yeah. line? Tw- in a pop- twelve ways over. Twelve that de- twelve ways over. You're dead. Yeah. What's you know? the, what's the what's that classic line? You're you're going up in a rocket that was bidding on, and, and the and the contractor well, well, got cont- <laughs> well by the lowest bidder. By yes. the lowest bidder. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And and. And and that's true, and I think that's part of, part and parcel why my brother got out of that is because he's it, after after the challenger the 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 you know the accident the first one. Well, I managed to cram an entire career in between Challenger and Columbia, mm-hmm. but I lo- I lost a friend on board Columbia. So, oh. um, uh, yeah, and and it's it's uh it's had some effects on me, yeah, uh, personally and professionally. So. Oh. I, I don't work in the program anymore. Yeah. I, I write. Yeah. So, um, but on the other hand, you know, I've written some stuff. I've, I've been able to, some of my writing has been a little bit cathartic. You know, I've been able to, to plug stuff in. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've also with, with some friends, I've been able to develop, um, a preliminary patent for what amounts to an astronaut escape pod. Mm. So, um, you know, we're, we're trying to get a little bit further on that. We need a little bit more funding. Yeah. Um, we've been doing it at this point entirely out of our own pockets and, and our own pockets are not that deep. 
So, <laughs> well, but yeah, maybe maybe you can answer this or not because my Chris the same way. You know, Chris was there after you know he was he spent his whole life. He got his undergraduate in aerospace engineering, got his graduate degree at UTSI in 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 propulsions, uh, aero aerospace. He actually developed his theses. He he developed a way of testing fuels on the the Earth. Uh, in a, in a fuel chamber that simulated space. And so they were able to test different liquid compounds and things, you know, different types of fuel and how they would burn here on earth, uh, prior to actually sending them up. So I, and so I can imagine this whole, my brother's whole life was dedicated towards this. And then once he started working with them and Morton Thiokol and some of the things he, he, he left, he said, I can't do this. He's, and, and I don't know if he was privy. Because you know, think about his he's Morton Thiokol, McDonald Douglas, but Morton Thiokol, and right after the Challenger, he's a propulsions expert, uh, designing yeah. fuels. So I have a feeling that he saw things. Or he he doesn't talk about it, and to be honest with you, and maybe I should have him on the show. But one of the things that he did say was the on on the challenge or the space shuttles. The crew compartment actually is made to separate from the craft. It has a blast door. No, 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 no. It 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 doesn't actually. Okay. Uh it it doesn't and that but but that said the the flight deck just by its very nature is more structurally okay. sound than the mid deck. Gotcha. Okay. What wound up happening, the guys that were, the, there's two places where they put, put astronauts on the shuttle, the flight deck and the mid deck for, for ascent. Mm -hmm. And the guy, the, the, the mid deck absorbed the full force of the explosion. Okay. When, the, when, when the, the, when the two tanks and the external tank went. Yes, ma'am. That, that, that hydrogen explosion, I mean, it just, it nailed the mid deck. Those guys were not surviving. Okay. Um, that said, the flight deck evidently did make it down intact mm. because because the four crew members that were on the flight deck were found um, still in their seats, mm -hmm. strapped in with oxygen masks on. Yeah. Now, what that means is they had to the guys in the back had to unstrap. They had to put on their own oxygen masks. Unstrap, lean for at least partly, lean forward, put the oxygen masks on the pilot and commander, mm -hmm. and then sit back down and strap in. Wow. So um, it's it's believed that the impact with because uh, they were falling from multiple that, miles up. Yeah. Okay, it's believed that the impact with the ocean killed them. Is what killed, and that was the thing I think that bothered my brother because he said that the nose cone. And, and I, like I said, if you don't feel comfortable talking about this, I, and because he was saying the nose cone originally was designed to actually have a, a chute in it, and they scrapped that because they needed to put more instrumentation in there, and that's something that bugged uh, me. Well, I'll tell you, the the design that flew mm -hmm. was not the original design, mm -hmm. And the original design, w there much, much, much would have been done differently. And you can lay the blame for Challenger and Columbia at the feet of Capitol Hill. No. Now, interestingly enough, where, where, where to me it gets absolutely, the, the whole mess gets really interesting is that at a certain point, Von, Von Braun was in on the development of the shuttle up until a certain point. And then at a certain point, he evidently flung up his hands and retired rather abruptly. Yeah. And, and, and about the same time was when the current design got shoved through. Yeah. Okay. So you can think about that one for a no, little bit. No, I, I I agree because, like I said, I know my brother to know that he wouldn't want to be part of anything that would that would cost someone their life. And he left. Like I said, you got to remember this is a guy who spent all his life. This is what he wanted to do, 
And soon after getting into the business and, you know, his con, I, I know my brother well enough to know that he's got a big heart and a huge conscience. And, uh, and, and he left, he's like, can't do this. I'm not going to do well, it. I'm not going to be privy to it. The, the challenger occurred relatively early on in my, in my career. I had yeah. just started, I live in Huntsville, Alabama. Okay. And I had just started, um, on a program. I was the resident astronomer for a DOD space-based sensor. And sure. that's about all I can tell you about it. Okay. 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 Um, and, and, but it was, we were on phase one research and development. And phase two was to have been prototype development and testing, which was intended to include a scale model, functional scale model flown on the shuttle, complete with payload specialists to operate it. Now, I was one of three candidates for payload specialist on the team. Um, and I had been working on re the research and development phase one for about two months when Challenger happened. Mm. And, of course, they grounded the fleet yeah. and uh, in indefinitely. And so phase two of my project got canceled. Um, I was still willing to go, but one thing led to another, and I, I wound up, because I didn't have that immediate route, um, I, I wound up not not going up. Hmm. I did, however, work many missions as a, a flight controller. Um, when Columbia went down, hmm. I had begun writing what later became my first published novel. It's called Burnout, the Mystery of STS uh, to a uh, uh, of spatial STS-281. Um, and it involves a space shuttle disaster scenario. Mm. But my fictional scenario was sabotage. In the course of my research, I pulled up all of the, the Challenger reports and read through them. And I said, okay, Challenger occurred on ascent. I want to make mine different. I don't want anybody thinking I'm trying to profit off of the tragedy. So I'm going to go to the opposite end of the mission. And I'm going to have mine occur during re-entry. And, hon, I want you to know, I had the first draft written and in the hands of my writing mentor when Columbia went down with my friend Casey Aborder. And Travis had to talk me out of trashing the manuscript because... I got the orbital inclination correct. I got the overflown states correct. I got the re-entry flight, flight path correct. I got the intended approach to the Cape correct. I got the region of breakup correct. I got the, the debris field correct. The overflown state, the whole bit. The only difference was that since my fictional scenario was sabotage, the debris field extended off the Texas coast into the Gulf by a little bit. That was the only difference. Wow. Wow. Uh, it, yeah, yeah. It, it freaked me pretty badly. I, um, I, I can imagine. Let's let's take a break right there. And I want that to digest because we actually have a natural break coming in into the okay. show. So I, right. before we get into it anymore. But I, I can't imagine. Now, I'm going to ask you this question. With everything you know and everything that you've experienced, if the call came tomorrow, and they asked, they said, Stephanie, we want you to go in space. Would you do it? Well, if my health were what it used to be, it would. I would say with, without a doubt in a heartbeat. You're my hero. I, I, but, I just, I just got to say, you're, you're, you're my hero. And it, it, you know, the movie The Right Stuff is mm – -hmm. Absolutely. These astronauts, I mean, people don't recognize, and like I said, we're coming up to a hard break, so we'll, we'll kind of leave with this, but people don't, uh, don't realize that space is hard and the potential for mishap is, is great. And I think we got spoiled between the, uh, we got spoiled watching the shuttles go. I remember when the first shuttle went up. 
I w- everybody's eyes were glued on. I was in Wisconsin. My father had a meeting with a good friend of his who was selling uh, ready, ready X-ray film <laughs> to, to, to him. And we were there with, with them. I remember sitting in the hotel watching that go up. But uh, we're talking about a very special guest, Stephanie Osborne, here at the Midnight Ocean. We'll be back. We're going to take about a four-minute break. Hang in there. we got to pay bills, and this is how we do it. So hang in there, and we'll be back in a few minutes. This is the Midnight Ocean with Jeff Norton on the Paranormal State Radio Network. with Jeff Norton on the Paranormal State Radio Network. That is right, Andrew. This is the Midnight Ocean Radio Show and a podcast. You can join us live here every weeknight from 10 p.m. till 2 a.m. Eastern Standard Time or on the web 
at www.themidnightocean.com. If you're joining us for the very first time on YouTube, make sure you hit that most important subscribe button. It means a lot to us. And, you know, we'll give you a shout out. We will definitely give you a shout out on the show. And for those that are joining us for the first time on Facebook Live, we just started broadcasting on Facebook. And you can find us at The Midnight Ocean. Hey, we're doing a very special thing for you Facebook listeners this week, and we'll probably carry it on. What we're asking you to do is to help get the word out. If you share our broadcast with other pages, other groups, groups you belong to, we will tally up the person that shared our broadcast the most, and we will give you a shout out on Friday. I will contact you personally and arrange a very special thank you gift to you that will be sent to your house. So we appreciate that, and we'll get the chat up uh, so I can monitor chat in YouTube as well. And for those that uh, we we use the uh, YouTube chat, as our main ways of communicating with us. We do have rules, no personal attacks, and you're gone. And if you respond to that personal attack, you're gone as well. Our moderators are have been instructed and they are known to be quick draw McGraws. <laughs> that, hey, we gotta keep it civil. So tonight's guest and is Stephanie Osborne, but before we return back to Stephanie, I do want to, I, I owe this apology to, uh, to Albert, Albert sent in his story for last night, and I didn't get to it. And so I'm going to make this very quick, uh, but I promised Albert that I would get to his story uh, here uh, tonight, and let's just go ahead and take care of that little bit of business. Hovering hovering, being at the bedroom window. Miami Gardens, this is, uh, I was 17. My bedroom was on the second floor window, where 12 feet off the ground. I got up to use the bathroom around 2 a.m. Something made me look out my window being being was hovering there outside where no human could have been silver gray large black orb eyes communicated to me without speaking that i should not fear him i was not afraid we stared at each other for about one to two minutes no other contact was attempted i felt calm but sure of what i saw left left to the restroom entity was gone when i came back for 43 years, I've never questioned what I saw. I always hope to see it, see it sometimes again, but never have. I felt peace and understanding if it makes any sense. There you go. So Albert, I, I believe you, man. I, I totally believe you. You only do these shows, uh, a, a short amount of time before you start to believe. So, so there you go, Albert. Got your story on the air and I appreciate you submitting that to us and, I will be reaching out to you tomorrow to get your information so we can send you a limited edition coffee mug. But without further ado, without haste, I want to get back to our guest because I know that she's calling in and uh, she's got other things that she probably want to be doing than being stuck on the air listening to alien stories. But uh, our, our very special guest, Stephanie Osborne. So, so, Stephanie, right before the break, I asked, I threw that out there, and I'm sorry to throw that curveball at you like that and, and make you answer or respond that quickly. But uh, so you would go back up in space. Everything that you knew, if your health would allow you to do it, you would do it without a, in a heartbeat. Yes, I would. Awesome. Yes, I would. Yeah. You see, you're my hero. I mean, oh. you, 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 you guys, astronauts, people, like I said, I, I have, I guess, an inside knowledge. Inside baseball uh, with my brother and, and everything, because uh-huh. I think he would. I, I I honestly believe that if he was asked to do it, he he would go. And uh, knowing what he knows, because he said the adventure is far greater than the risk, or oh, yes. it would be more rewarding than the risk. We 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 work really really hard. Yeah, there's there's the whole lowest bitter thing, sure, mm-hmm. but. Those of us that worked the program worked really, really hard to ensure those guys and gals got up there safe and came back home safe. We weren't always successful, but I can say, having looked at some of the other space programs in the world, we were a heck of a lot more successful than the others. (laughs) Um, If you don't believe me, just go look up something called the Nettlin Incident. 
N E D E L I N. That was a massive catastrophe that the Soviet space program had early on. And wiped out wiped out their entire team down to one, one man. One and he only made it out because he happened to uh, walk around behind the bunker to take a smoke break. Wow. It's probably the only time one can say cigarettes saved somebody's life. Wow. Yeah, yeah. I, I actually, it's not that I don't believe you. I actually just Googled it. And, and see, these are things you never hear about. Mm hmm. You, you, you never, you never and, hear about and, it. And we still don't know that, I mean, it was hushed up so tightly mm. for, for decades. We still don't know all of the details. But I've seen some of the, they had um, security film footage, and it's, it's horrific. It's, it's really bad. What happened was they were running, supposed to be running a test on the pad in preparation for launch. They had some problems, so rather than stop the countdown and uh, troubleshoot, they kept the countdown running and were trying to troubleshoot through the countdown, including tanking the fuel. And they used a particularly noxious and extremely corrosive and toxic fuel that was it was it was a hypergolic fuel, which means that it didn't need a spark. All it needed was contact with the oxidizer, and it was gone. Mm. Um, but it was nicknamed Devil's Venom, just because of its incredibly corrosive and toxic properties. Well, they because of all this troubleshooting, they tanked too soon and they wound up having to hold some stuff anyway and it sat too long and it burned through and ignited on the pad and um, Marshall Nedlin who was their version of of our Von Braun Werner Von Braun mm -hmm. um, was, was um, he insisted that his entire team bring chairs and sit there around the pad watching the test take place. So he and his entire team, except for the guy that ducked into the bum bunker to, to smoke a cigarette, died within seconds. Okay. I, I got to ask. I mean, did Nettleman have issues? I mean, was this like, did he have... He was was he a control freak? Yes. Oh, well, I guess my question is this, is that that almost seems like a mass suicide to me. Um, it was not the brightest thing that they could have done. Yeah. But the, the problem was, Nedlin, he his attitude was, you should take pride in your work. You should be here watching. And the only alternative, because, you know, he was like, this is what you will do. And the only only alternative uh, was to get sent to the gulags. Wow. Yeah. Because the guy that, that wound up taking Nedlin's place, they actually had to bring from the gulags. So, yes. I, I, don't, um, I mean, it's tragic. I don't mean to like laugh, but I, I'm, I'm, it's a laugh of disgust well, by if, what the heck were you thinking? Yeah, I know. I, I, I totally understand. I, I, I really do. Um, it was one of those political, politico military, because he came from the military. You have to remember, at this point in time, there was no difference between their quote-unquote civilian space program and their military. It was one and the same. Okay. So, so the rockets that they were building, they were building not just to carry people, but to carry nuclear warheads. And warheads. Right. So, so this, and, and he came from that military, Soviet military mentality. Hmm. And, and it wound up killing the entire team, which is probably one of the reasons why they never really were able to mount. Um, at that point, they were pretty much out of the moon race. No, we didn't know it, no. but uh, and, they, and and they made sure it it didn't really start coming out. We knew something happened, 
We didn't know the magnitude of it until after the Soviet Union fell. Okay. So, so yeah, it, and it was it was pretty it was pretty. Now, it was pretty bad. Now, it was bad. I mean, we've had three. We had three. You know, known actions. I'm sure there's there's been a lot more that we don't know of. But no, no, just any any other astronauts that have died, um, uh, um, not of disease or something, sure. ha- have died as a result of something like a car crash or a plane crash well, or something like that. So, so I take it that you don't subscribe to the secret uh, space program. Um, if there is one, it's not NASA. If it's it's military because NASA is really pretty separate from the military, yeah. especially these days. Original, the you know the early in the program we pulled our astronauts from military, but they were actually on loan to NASA. So it was, it was and and these days we don't even have that. So yeah, yeah, NASA is not doing anything obviously with with Bezos and 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 Elon Musk and. We'll, we'll get there too. I, I want to get your opinion. Okay. So, but all right, let's go back now, to maybe. Now, let me let me, let me let me let me let me let me caveat that for a second. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Go. I'm not saying that there isn't some sort of a secret space program, but if there is, it is on the military side. Yeah. It's it's the Air Force and those guys doing it. And to be honest with you, it's secret. <laughs> I mean, it's kind well, of you know we, yeah. we wouldn't know about it. If it was, but I, I just, like I said, you know, they have that one, what is it, the XB-35 or whatever that orbits now. It looks like a miniature yeah. version to drone version of the shuttle. No yeah. one to this day knows what that thing does. Uh, That's true. But the- I, I'm, I'm sure there's some things going on. Uh, I'm not sure it's a manned program. Mm-hmm. And um, because I don't think that thing is big enough for uh, – I don't think it's big enough to be man rated. Oh no, no! It, uh, it, it when it's up there for a year too. I mean, it, it orbits. Yeah, yeah, a, yeah. A year, and and so. so and and so it's not nearly big enough to carry all of the consumables that would be required for a human crew. Yeah. But but that doesn't really change any. If it's not a manned program, that doesn't really change anything because we already knew they were putting up spy satellites and all that kind of stuff. So. Correct. Yeah, I mean, yeah, we don't know, and that's the other thing too. I I know, and this is the thing. I I have a lot, and we are going to be bringing on an expert in the secret space program. I guess the problem that I have is shooting a rocket in space is not an event that goes unnoticed. Bingo. Yeah, I, you can't you can't you you can't ignore it. You can't fake it. Yeah, you can't hide it. Yeah, because we so. We sit, I mean, we're, we're over in Ormond. Well, we're, my family's over in Ormond Beach, which is on the east side. And it's a good 100 miles from the, from, from the launch. And we yeah. sit out there clear day and you can watch them and you can hear them. Oh, yeah. I, you know, I've, so. I've, I've watched, I've watched, uh, I've watched shuttle launches up and down the, the, uh, the east coast of Florida yeah. on up into Georgia. Uh, and, and, uh, I've seen them, I've got pictures on my website that I took from my hotel room. Uh, I've seen multiple launches from Orlando, yeah. you know? Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's like, and I know a lot of people say, well, you want the closer you get to the equator. So you got some of these third world countries, but even then, I mean, with everybody so sensitive with, you know, with, with the geopolitical, a launch is not going to go undetected. I, I am no. sorry. There are too many too many countries, too many entities, too many, too many NGOs that you're going to have to pay off to, to keep that one hit. And then you've got all of the civilian astronomers that are out there every night. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Every night and, that and, they're looking. And, and, and see, the thing works in the, in the opposite direction, too. The people that say that we never went to the moon. Yeah. Well, you know, we had to because we <laughs> – do you really think the Soviets would have kept their mouths shut if – if we hadn't, yeah, correct. Because they would have, they would have known. Well, it, it, and like I said, there they there are. Uh, I believe they didn't NASA because they, NASA just got fed up with 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 it. I was listening to an Art Bell show actually last night after my show, and and apparently there was a report because they they had a bunch of science. Well, what happened was, you know, all of these there was there was several discovery channel shows that came out about oh we never went to the moon 
And then NASA, they had school teachers that were calling up and saying, our kids, because most of the kids today, even myself, we don't remember the moonwalks. We, I wasn't old enough. And so... Whippersnapper. Yeah, I was born in 69. <laughs> so there you go. There's my age. But um, I wasn't old enough. I, I don't remember uh, the you know all of those programs. And it was funny because a lot of the newer gen, the millennials don't even know space because, you know, at least I grew up with the space shuttle going up, mm-hmm. right? The, yeah, a lot of the millennials right. don't even know what the space shuttle, they didn't know that. And so NASA finally said, look, because they were getting all these calls from these teachers saying, look, we got to do something. So I think NASA built a telescope uh, just to lock it on uh the moon to say hey look here here you can see the vehicle you can see the landers here they are on the moon you can see the remnants you can see our you know you can see the uh the the rovers that we were riding in you can see all that and come on over and i believe they put the telescope in georgia somewhere on one of the building one of the science buildings and and now you can actually go and uh and they will show you you go to Georgia and they will show you the uh the the landers on the moon. And uh it was it was just I don't like I said everybody not not everything has to be a conspiracy. It, yeah. It's great. It makes entertaining radio, trust me. But I I think there's some things that are just I I don't know. Uh, like I'm going to have and and we're going to get into this too because I promise uh, the we have a lot of flat earthers uh that like to uh come on to the show and talk about the flat earth and i'll get your opinion on that here in a little bit i already know what it's pro i don't know i don't know we haven't talked ahead of yeah, time but yeah you, you do you, you you can you can figure it out because yeah. of what i just said <laughs> yeah, yeah i, I already, yeah I already, well this thing called orbit <laughs> you, you know the whole and that was and uh-huh. I want to explain, that was one thing of my brother I actually got me in trouble because I he's he was four years ahead of me. So he was coming out of his undergrad as an aerospace. And, you know, of course, I was in high school taking physics. And the whole thing is they, they taught you at the time is that there's no gravity in space. So my brother's like, well, absolutely not. There is gravity in space. That's what you call orbits because you're always in a falling state. But there are gravity. There is gravity in in space it's just yeah you know you're, it's, you're you're weightless because you're constantly falling you're constantly falling around an orb <laughs> you know around right. an elliptic you, you it, it's the one time that you can honestly say that you fell and missed yeah that's right that's right and <laughs> stuff so yeah and it's and that's how you have orbits and that's but and, you know, whatever so uh, going back, and I don't know how much of this. Can you please explain what actually happened on Apollo One? I know that we that was our first space tragedy. Yeah. Um, what happened was that they were on the pad. It was not time for launch. They were doing some preliminary testing. It was relatively early in the countdown. The testing was supposed to occur. Um, there was this new thing, new, newly developed thing called Velcro. And the astronauts had gone hog wild using it to stick notes and cue cards and everything else all over the inside of the cabin. At the same time, as it turned out, one of the cables had been caught in a what amount what amounted to a metal cabinet door and as things were being moved around and shifted and and everything that cable insulation began to fray um now this i'm i'm giving you the abbreviated version mm-hmm. all right uh, yeah, it's there's the reports are online now you can go read them for yourselves if you want details i'm trying to fit this into a, a couple minutes um at the same time this was while they were still using pure oxygen uh to pressurize the cabin um one thing led to another there was a spark there was enough highly flammable material in the cabin to ignite in the pure oxygen environment. Um, 
Unfortunately, in an earlier mission in in the um, in the Mercury program, uh, you will remember that Gus Grissom was almost killed on splashdown because the pyro bolts around his hatch blew mm-hmm. and blew the hatch away from the cabin, which then from the capsule, which then started filling up with water. Um, they got him out. Or he got himself out, and they got him. The helicopter got the the capsule, tried to lift it out of the water, but there was too too much water, and it almost took the helicopter down. They had to cut the cable, let the thing sink. It was a few re, few years ago; it was recovered. Um, as a result of that incident, the hatch was redesigned to open inward on Apollo. Now, if you've ever studied physical chemistry, you know that when a gas is heated, it expands. Right. And it also increases. If if it is in a confined volume, the pressure increases rather than the volume. Okay? Now we have hot oxygen continuing to increase in temperature. So the pressure continues to increase. The hatch can't open outward. They have to push it inward. There's too much pressure. They can't get it open. The pressure actually increased so great that it cracked the the capsule open like an egg. Uh, It's my understanding uh, that the astronauts did not they, they they didn't die of burns. They actually died from asphyxiation because of all of the Impressive. their well that and the um the hot air and the smoke because it burned through their umbilical cords which supplied the oxygen to their suits and they they asphyxiated. See, I I never heard that explanation. I've always heard the classic, you know, they they were in the liquid oxygen. They had that the the oxygen inside it leaked. That was my question: is how did they have the oxygen to begin with? But you're saying it's just part of the pressurization process. And right, then, that and- was that was normal cabin atmosphere at that point in time. So. As a result of that, they changed and they started developing mixes. So you have to be careful because. When you're when you're in a spacecraft, um, if you're going to just stay in the spacecraft, that's one thing. But if you're going to be doing EVAs, then you're depressurizing and repressurizing right. and stuff like that. So the pressure changes. Yep. So you wind up with weird crap happening in your bloodstream. Yep. The, yep. You know the the bends, etc. Well, so any yeah, any three gas diver will tell you that, especially around here. You know they. And, yeah. And, and so you get what I'm talking about there. Yep. And so they had they had to to work on developing some some combinations of gases that didn't cause a problem when you were depressurizing and repressurizing for spacewalks or whatever. Um, but up until that time, they didn't have they just used pure oxygen and they didn't have to worry about any of that. But then they discovered, well, crap, you know. Maybe this isn't such a good idea. Um, so that's that's wow. basically what happened for Apollo One. So where did the Velcro come into play? You mentioned Velcro. It, Velcro. It turns out is extremely flammable. Uh, and I, if memory serves, if memory serves, it also when it when it combusts, it gives off toxic. The toxic fumes. fumes. Oh yeah, the plastic, the polymers in there. Yeah, I mean, I've, I I I, I believe vaguely. I think I've experience that one i was i was one of these i was a boy scout and as a boy scout we we tend to like throw anything and everything in fires yeah. <laughs> so, you know plastic bags uh, all sorts of different things and so I, I can imagine the polymers in there so uh causing uh fumes for them wow see i never heard that explanation i just knew there was a fire but i never knew the pressure the door you see you learn something new 
every day with our special guests. We're going to take, a, obviously, a four-minute break. When we come back, Stephanie, I do want to get back into your book and some of the unfortunate premonitions that you had when you were writing your book in the, in the, uh, the Columbia disaster. But this is uh, the Midnight Ocean. Join us here. We are speaking with our very special guest, Stephanie Osborne. She is, if you guys haven't figured it out, a a scientist, a a space explorer. <laughs> so she was part of the space program for many years. But we'll take a few minutes break, and then when we get back, we will start delving into her books. This is the Midnight Ocean with Jeff Norton on the Paranormal State Radio Network.
That is right, Andrew. This is uh, the Midnight Ocean radio show on the Paranormal State Radio Network. Oh, man. Talk about Paranormal State Radio. We've been working on that site uh, with our web developers. We have about four more sites that we're launching. Uh, Hold tight, guys. The Midnight Listener site will be soon. So you guys will have a forum and a way of contacting and all of you non-Facebook people can participate with the Midnight Listeners. It's MidnightListener.com, not with an S, just Midnight Listener. Wow, I'm learning a lot. I didn't realize until I, uh, during the break there, I am actually working or wearing, as we speak with our very special guest, Stephanie Osborne, about uh, the space program. I, Stephanie, I don't know if you're, if you're watching on YouTube or anything like that, but, and if you turn on YouTube, there's a 10 second delay. I'll warn you. Uh, but I am wearing the Russian, the Pokemo, uh, hat tonight, the Russian space agency. How do you pronounce that? How do you pronounce that? Do you know, you know what? I, I, I don't do Russian and you I don't, don't do, do it very well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm actually wearing it's the, it's the Poco. And I believe that they, they, it's not in Russian. I think they translated it. They they English fight it. Ros Ros Cosmos. Yeah. Well. Yeah. It's it started with a P, but it's funny. Oh, P P is an R. Oh. In in Russian. So the the, the Russian I, one thing I do know is that the Russian alphabet uh, is actually loosely based on the Greek. Uh, when when the uh, when the Greek Orthodox missionaries moved into the area, they didn't have a written language, so they came up with. Uh, they they adapted the Greek alphabet and then added some other symbols uh, for for sounds that they didn't that the Russians had that the Greeks didn't. Oh, and so it became the Cyrillic alphabet. Gotcha. So so what looks like a P is a row. Is a row, which is an is an R oh, sound. So I've been saying so it yeah. wrong all along. <laughs> so it's probably it's probably Roscosmos. That's that's the last I knew Roscosmos. was was the name of their that's agency. That's it. Yeah, that that's it. Yeah, that's what I'm wearing. And uh, this was actually sent to me by a viewer because I I tend to wear black hats on this show, and so oh, okay. I, I have viewers and and people that send me send me hats and say here. And this is this is from the Russian space program. So and I didn't plan that. I just put it up because I do have a NASA hat as well, and I do have a SpaceX hat that was given to me. I'm not going to wear it because it was actually signed. I should probably bring it out and show people, but uh, cool. that was signed uh, by several of the engineers and Mr. Musk himself. So that's pretty cool. Very cool. Yeah. So, uh, well, they I, said I it have, was. <laughs> I have worked. I have worked with uh, people from the Russian space program, the Japanese space program, the Indian space program, ESA, and a few others. Uh, but I'm, I'm, I really just never quite caught on to Russian. Or Japanese. Yeah. I, some some of the others I did okay with, but not it, those. Which is funny because I was I was I was a military brat, so I was born in Japan. And ah. I don't know any Japanese. I just I love sushi though. That's all I can tell you. More for you. <laughs> I love sushi. I, I love raw fish. I'm into that. But that's what I don't mind I don't I don't mind the raw fish. It's the seaweed I can't stand. It's, yeah. It's, all right, sorry. Go I, ahead. I love it all, you know, but most people didn't didn't join. I do want to say that Debbie, we actually we what it is we have the show that's feeding live to YouTube and also the Facebook at the same time, and on top of that, it's going out over the web through podcast and and different affiliate stations and stuff. But I just got an alert. One of my one of our guests here, here you go, and this is going to lead into the next question for you, uh, Stevie. I'm going to put you on the hot seat here, so Debbie. Debbie, I'm not going to say your last name. She she just reported, I'm sitting on the deck as usual, and every night there's a helicopter patrolling the sky. Just now, he got really close. It's very strange. This is like nothing I've ever seen before. It's not your typical shape. It's like thin in the middle. It has two forks like looking thin, thins in the front and back. It's totally silent. I live in a spot. Of, I lived in this spot for a while, and every night when it gets dark, he shows up. This will go on until dawn. Hey. Debbie, take a picture. Take a video of it. I mean, it might be, who knows? It might be a private drone that someone has, has built uh, and, and is flying in your neighborhood. But take a picture of that and uh, send it to us. We'd love to love to see it on the show. Um, you know, the kind of segue. So are you, now, so, how do I say? I'm just going to come out and ask you. Okay. Are you a believer? You believe in yeah. UFOs? 
Uh, as far as I'm concerned, the jury is still out. I don't disbelieve in them, but yeah. I don't necessarily. Okay. I'll say this. UFO stands for unidentified flying object. Do I believe there are unidentified flying objects? Yes. Absolutely. Okay. Do we know what they are? No. By definition, they're unidentified. <laughs> Um, do I believe that there's aliens flying around our 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 planet? Um, the jury is still out. Uh, nobody has presented me. I, I I don't say there aren't, but nobody's presented me with sufficient evidence to believe that there are either. You know, bring me an ashtray or something off of one of the darn things. Yeah. You know. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was you know I was I was talking with Brad Olson. Of course, he, he you know he wrote the Eccentric series, and he, he's on a lot of the ancient alien shows. And mm -hmm. and it was, and and he he and I both came to the same thing that we don't care until we get the fly one. They we I don't we don't believe in them until we yeah. actually got you know get to yeah. put our hands on them and get inside them and fly them and then crash them because more than likely we'll crash them. <laughs> In the uh, I've 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 played around on a multi-axis simulator. Give me the controls. <laughs> yeah, you can do it. Yeah, you can. Do it. That's one that you know. When I was going to flight school, a lot of the guys that were like, "Oh, you got to go get your help," and I'm like, "Are you kidding me? Are you, are you nuts? I can't do that. I mean, I, I'm not that coordinated." Because <laughs> <So, laughs> people you're flying a helicopter is hard to do, and uh, yeah, flying in all 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 the or all uh, oh gosh. I want to say all axis. I should say all axis. Yeah, yeah. Is difficult. Sixth off. Yeah, trying to do it at the same time. But uh, for, for listeners, six off means six degrees of freedom. You've got X, Y, and Z. You've got pitch rolling, y'all. There you go. So six six axes. It, six, and it's uh, yeah, it, it, it takes some practice. It's not something that you're just going to jump in and do. Oh, oh no, no, yeah, no, no, no. Yeah, and it's funny. Most most helicopter pilots, for those out there listening, and, and like the flight school that I went to actually had a helicopter school as well. So most of the helicopter pilots were guys that have you know upwards of two thousand hours of flight time, IFR flight time. These are guys that 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 are. You know, on two thousand hours as a as a civilian is a lot of hours. I mean, you're mm -hmm. you're usually an instructor to get the to log those many hours, and you know, and then they go into helicopters, <laughs> you know, and then they yeah. got another, you know, about a thousand hours of training. Uh, well, they, I think the the training is something like three hundred twenty hours, but I believe that they log close to a thousand hours before they're actually, you know, ready to go. In, yeah. Into the real world, it's just, it's 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 pretty intense. Yeah, yeah. I I hats off to the helicopter pilots and and of course of course if they have a problem it's a, it's really intense because they don't have any glide surfaces to speak of. Exactly, exactly. So, they have auto gyro and that's about it. And have you, yeah. ever, you ever see a helicopter and, auto gyro on YouTube? It, it's, yeah, it's yeah. oh yeah. Yeah, you're you're better off taking your hands out and flapping them. Well, <laughs> not quite, yeah. but yeah. yeah. And and hey, you know, if something happens to them blades, forget the auto gyro, you know? Yeah. Well, forget the whole the, the the at that point the whole the whole craft is out of balance and you're in trouble. Yeah. Oh yeah. There, there's nothing you're, you're, you know. It's it's like flying rock. Yep. <laughs> yep. I mean even when I you know, I, I flew a CJ uh CJ five, a hawker and a challenge you know, and and even those planes, even though they're heavy as, as all get out, they still have a glide slope to them. Oh, yeah. And you can... Well, you know, the, the shuttle itself, um, it was a glider, but the astronauts referred to it as the flying brick. As the brick. Yeah. Yeah, so... Yeah, it's, it's all about height. If you give me enough height, I can... I can height put... and speed. If, if, you, if your initial speed yeah. is, is sufficient, then, yeah, you can make almost anything glide. Yeah. Yeah, and that that's but, something you learn. That that's one of it, it's funny because people ask me what flight school's like and it's I tell them it's it's about 20% of learning how to fly, the flight characteristics of the airplane, and it's 80% on how not to crash. Yeah. I mean, that's, well, uh, make it make it 78% and the other 2% are absolute terror. Yeah. Well, that's true too. I had a few. <laughs> I had a few when I you know, when I was flying my my check ride on a on a on the uh CJ I was coming in and this is the thing is that flying a jet's different than flying a prop plane because a prop plane you power back when you hit the runway you know when you hit the tip of the runway you power down a jet you actually power in you got to remember it's different 
And I don't know what I, I was in a King Air. I was flying a King Air. And, and then I went over to the CJ5 to do a check ride. And, and I, and I powered back. Of course, that kicked the speed, the speed, that arm, the speed brakes, right? You arm the speed brakes right as you're coming in. So that kicked mm. the speed brakes back and we about fell out of the sky. It, it was, uh, and yeah. And, and of course, my, my instructor pilot was next to me. He slammed that throttle down, man. And we just, I mean, we took off like a bat, but it, it just, because instinctively, you know, flying prop planes for so long and then jumping into the jet, I just, I, I screw, that's why you have checklists, right? And you go yep. through them and you talk through them and you do all you that. Bet. For some reason, my, my, my muscle memory, I, I throttled back and you do to a point, but you don't, it's not like on a prop where you come all the way back and you glide it in. And what it is, is that you have a cushion of air for, and we'll get to the space here, but for you people that are out there listening, what happens is your wings develop lift as you come closer to the earth because you have the pressure between the wings and, and the runway. So that kind of gives you a lift. Well, on a jet, because it's so heavy, you don't have that lift. Well, you do, but it's negligible. It's not. It's, it's, it, it, the percentage is lower. It's percentage <laughs> low, And it's not like a jumbo jet, which has huge wings, because the bigger airplanes, they do you do feel that on a small private jet. And it's it was different. So yeah, we kicked the speed brakes on, and ooh, we were we we definitely fell below glide. And, and next thing I know, we you know he he, and that's why you always keep your hand on the throttle. You always have two people with their hands on the throttle, and he he saved us. We were we were going to become a skid mark, and on the runway. That was my first check. <laughs> Needless to say, I didn't check. <laughs> yeah, it, it was. I was back down in. uh I was back down in Illinois, uh, going back through the simulators <laughs> and through, through through flight school. Well, I, but it, for me, I probably could have done it and been fine. But obviously, my training I needed to get, I needed to put some more sim time in and yeah. uh, and stuff. So and you know, so it only it only goes to say, especially in your field, these astronauts are highly trained. Highly trained yes. individual. I mean, it's amazing the amount that they go. And like I said, they spend their whole lives and, and it's so tragic to, to hear the, these events that happen to these individuals who've committed their whole life to, yeah. uh, to space. But let's change. Well, I don't know if we're changing it to a happier something. Right before we went on the break two segments ago, your book, the STS 281, correct? Yeah, it's it's a fictional it's a fictional flight number. Yeah. Uh, the 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 book is called Burnout: uh, The Mystery of Space Shuttle STS two eighty one. Two eighty one. And I deliberately chose I deliberately chose a number big enough that I knew we weren't going to get to it. Correct. Uh, that way, nobody can say it was this flight or whatever, you know. Uh, but yeah, that was my first novel. Um, here it is, seven years later. And uh, by the end of the year, I should have 30 titles in print that I have authored, co-authored, or to which I have contributed. Hmm. So, yes, I've been busy. You, you've been a v very busy. Yes. I and mean, that's writing one book. It, I, I, I haven't even written my first one yet. <laughs> I get to about 20 pages and I stop. I've got about four or five huh. manuscripts I've started. And I get to the 20th page and I'm like, okay, I'm done. Well. Start off then. First off, don't worry about page numbers. Word count. Yeah. Word count is the way to do it. Yeah. Uh, that way, it, you, page number you can vary depending on your font, but <laughs> word count word count never varies that's, regardless of font size. Yeah, that, that's true. So I've done that you know, trick. <laughs> you know that, that you might look at uh, at trying your hand at a short story, yeah. or or a novelette. You got short story, novelette, novella, and novel, and then whole freaking series. <laughs> then, then, the whole, then the whole series, which, yeah, yeah. I, you know, I I've written I've re written uh, professional uh, articles for for magazines, and I've written uh, technical documents and things like that. So I do know how to write. I've done you know my share of writing. I've done my you know especially with patents and filling out all of that, all the requirements for that. So I do know how to do it. It's just one of those things where I, I always find an excuse 
And there is really no excuse. You just got to sit down and do it. It's like everything else. But I, I did want to go back to your book. I mean, you mentioned something that was curious to me in a sense. And to me, it proves science does work. So you hypothetically, uh, this was a, a space shuttle. You know, obviously you tried to put it, you know, way out there. You tried, you said that you did it on entry versus, um, exit, yep. you know, you know right. to make it kind of so you weren't right and, and everything. And you, through your expertise and your knowledge of space, wrote, all right, if this happens, so you you predicted everything that basically was going to go wrong, except yours was a sabotage versus it was, a, a I think, a, a mechanical kind of breakup with, with the Challenger. Um, Correct. Or, and, <clears throat> Correct. So that, I mean, the science is there. I yeah. Mean, the, you put a lot of science. I mean, did you model it? Did you just do this in your head? How did you... Did you work with some other people? No, I I had enough uh, I had enough experience, uh, technical experience, uh, working console and stuff by that point, and I I had made it a point as as I trained and as I went through my missions, I learned as much as I could about the overall system. I worked out of the payload control center here in Huntsville, mm -hmm. but I also knew what was going on down at the Cape. I knew what was going on in Houston. I knew how things worked on orbit. Um, and, and I had friends in most of those places. And so, you know, I, I could get my hands on, um, if you've ever seen the movie Space Cowboys, mm -hmm. um, that it's, it's a fun romp. There's a lot of stuff they get wrong. One of the things they got right was the emergency bailout procedure at the end of the movie. And I knew that as soon as I saw him start in on it, because I had actually gotten my hands on the, the, uh, the various and sundry abort procedures and read through them. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I knew uh, what I was seeing when they started depicting it. Um, so yeah, I, I've, I studied all of that stuff as I was going through, um, my, my work. And so most of it, I, I, I didn't really talk to anybody about it. I just got my hands on the documentation I wanted and, and read through it and said, okay, this has to happen in this order. Um, if we're going to have this happen, then this has to be an initial condition and I came at it from the standpoint of my science background. Um, if you're working a physics problem, then you want to know what your initial conditions are so that once you set the model in motion, you know you're going to have these results. Hmm. And that's, that's kind of how the way I set the scenario up. And so I actually, I actually took some, some, some metaphorical pages out of some of the missions that I had worked and said, well, I want to, this to be a tethered satellite mission. And they were going to be in this particular orbital inclination because of, of this reason. And they, there's, there's only so many orbital inclinations that the shuttle can fly. So I'm limited there. There's like three or four. And so I pick one. So I've got, you know, what, a 25 to 33% chance right there. Um, and then there's only so many different ways that you can approach the Cape. And once you know that, then you are limited. Those two things tell you what states are going to be overflown or if the states are going to be overflown. Because it's, if it's coming up from, from the south, it may come across Mexico or something. Um, anyway, there, there's there's these different things, and so once I had established what I wanted to be happening on that mission, it set those parameters. Okay. And once those parameters were set, the rest of it fell into place. It just happened to be sheer, dumb, horrifying luck that essentially the the mission. Columbia's last mission required those same parameters. Hmm. So it wound up being, you know, the same orbital inclination, 
the same intended approach to the Cape, the same overflown states, all of that, because once again, once once you've established the requ- the orbital requirements, the rest of the stuff falls out automatically. It, it you can if you've got this orbital inclination and you're coming in uh, at this point in the orbit, then your only approach to the Cape is this trajectory and this flight path. So that it automatically requires that you fly over these particular states. You see what I'm saying? I got you. Yeah. So it's okay. so the sign. I mean, we yeah. So the, it's not like they come in on different flight path. It's it's pretty much a standard. The standard. Yeah. Pro- okay. Oh, well. All right. So and and please, I understand you lost a friend on that flight. Yes. So so I want to be sensitive of that. And if I you know please let me know because this is a conversation, but I, it's intriguing because I I've had so many questions about. It. My my first question is how can you not how how the how can NASA not know that one of their ships because these things are pressurized correct how how could they not know that it didn't that it had a hole in it or not have a hole in it um because the cabin is pressurized but the wings are not but you would think they would have some kind of sensor that would say hey look. They had- that there's there's no need for pressure sensors inside the wing. They had temperature sensors inside it. And we know we know we know what happened based partly on the temperature sensor data. Yeah, I guess that was the the question. So when the when the when they decided to deorbit the shuttle, did they know that they had they had these issues that they had it or because I you know the classic thing where you hear them talking about the pressure the the temperature rising inside the landing gear bay and and everything well, let me let me let me let me give you, try to give you a quick synopsis sure. we got time oh we got we got more than enough time because i think that okay. these, there's a, a lot of us out here i don't think a lot of us truly understood or understand what happened with it, it's kind of like a lot of us didn't understand what happened with our with our astronauts you know and, and the fact that, on the first mission that failed. So, so please let us, okay. yeah, 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 we got time. With, with, with Columbia, uh, basically what happened was um, the, the insulating foam on the external tank, because the external tank is so big, it has to be sprayed in segments and allowed to cure dry. Mm-hmm. Um, unfortunately, that very fact tends to lead to slight non-uniformities where you stopped one batch and picked up on the next batch mm-hmm. and so we had a cold a cold day we had uh we had uh cryogenics inside the tank we had ice form it tended to uh cause bits and pieces of this foam to spall off of the external tank on this particular launch a piece of foam spalled off that was approximately attache case sized and it smacked into the leading edge of one of the wings. I was I want to say it was the port wing, but I don't quote me on that. I may be remembering wrong. So it hit the leading edge. It hit hard enough to break a hole in the reinforced carbon carbon composite that made up the leading edge. And then it proceeded to rake down the underneath side of the wing and gouged a groove in the um, in in the piles, and probably um, caught and bent the flashing around the landing gear door on that side. Okay. Um, we know that something that was roughly shaped like that flashing metal metal flashing floated away from the underneath side of the orbiter uh, on orbit. So, we have this scenario. So, as the thing comes in, you wind up with um, hot plasma forming around the craft because of the speed of reentry uh, and friction. And so, you wind up with this uh, ionized gas, hot ionized gas, blowing into the hole in the, the leading edge of the wing. So, it goes in and it's hot. It's not supposed to be in there. It starts... 
uh, the, we, we noticed that the temperature sensors uh, closest to the place of the breach began to spike. And it softened the wing. At the same time, it's blowing in through that missing flashing into the landing gear. Yeah. Hey, uh, hey Stephanie, I hate to do this, but we got to take a break here. Okay. It's, it's the bottom of the hour, so we'll take a, a four-minute break. We'll come back. Because, uh, yeah, this is this is fascinating stuff. Because, I, you know, I've heard the government explanation, but I want to hear it from someone who, 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 who knows and doesn't have ties or allegiance to to the government and to NASA and and the and those programs. So, you are we are listening to our good friend Stephanie Osborne is joining us as she's explaining what happened to the Columbia, and uh, you know this is personal for her. So be respectful. We'll be back in a minute. This is the Midnight Ocean with Jeff Norton on the Paranormal State Radio Network. Thank you. 
Midnight Ocean with Jeff Norton on the Paranormal State Radio Network. That is right, Andrew. This is the Midnight Ocean Radio Show and a podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Norton. You can join us live here every weeknight from 10 p.m. till 2 a.m. Eastern Standard Time or on the web at www.themidnightocean.com. For those that are on Facebook, we're, we're streaming live the first time on Facebook, and I do notice it is kind of jittery out there. Don't know what's going on there, but you can join us always over at YouTube. You type in The Midnight Ocean in the YouTube channel. That seems to be a little bit more robust. I know that Facebook is still trying to get their technology worked out. I will tell you as well that uh, it's just one of these things. Facebook is a social media site. YouTube is a video site. So their infrastructure is completely different. And um, so you can join us over there at YouTube. We'd love love to have you. Uh, but uh, that's been that's proven technology. We're but we're experimenting with with Facebook, and I like it. Uh, and maybe who knows we might they might be able to get it worked out the other thing too is that Facebook I don't think was really intended for a four hour show like we have going on here so if you ever want to uh, kick on over to YouTube you're more than welcome to and make sure while you're there you hit the subscribe button that helps us out tremendously and you can always catch us live on the internet through Spreaker through many of our apps you can download if you go to our website themidnightocean.com we have several, we have Android, we have uh, uh, Android, we have iPhone apps. You can get us and get the audio as well. And that way you don't have to look at my mug all night long <laughs> and stuff. For those that are on our website, the other thing too, get out there. Uh, Manu Indorami, as you guys know, is a guest on the show. He, he, you know, Star Trek fame and various other shows. Uh, he's going to be joining us here in the next couple of days to talk about his new project called the circuit but we have a link there it's the only one that we're going to put up on our site because that's you know i I love the project and love what they're doing so get out there and if you're a star trek fan if you're one of those big fans if you're into the 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 role playing or the cosplay and all that you understand what the circuit's about but he's going to be joining us here probably the next couple days just as a friend and also to promote his project, uh, the circuit. But but click on that and uh, take a look at it. You have my permission. <laughs> if you want to do it now, you can do that. You're not going to hurt my feelings. But take a look at what they're doing, and it's pretty. It's a pretty cool, pretty cool project. But getting back to our guest in the matter at hand, Stephanie Osborne. Sorry about that, Stephanie. Unfortunately, we do have to pay bills, and that's how we we <laughs> we do it around here because we don't charge for subscriptions or anything like that. So. So it's 100%. And the other thing, too, is it gives everybody a break <laughs> to, to get some coffee and things. So before we went off, you were explaining the hot plasma that was coming up on the, uh, the shuttle Columbia uh, and as it was making its reentry. Right. Um, so basically, you've got a, a hole, small hole in the leading edge of the wing. And uh, further on back on that same wing, you have um, hot the hot gases blowing in, not only in the hole, but also up into the landing gear bay, because that flashing is gone, right? So, most people don't stop to think about the tires on the shuttle. They're huge. Oh, they're, they're massive. Also, they're also pressurized, yeah. just, like a, just like a semi-truck tire, just bigger. Yeah. Have you have you ever seen what happens to a semi truck tire if the semi catches on fire? Oh, it, it, yeah, it, it's devastating. What does it do? Well, they explode. Exactly. Yeah. So you've just had you've got all this, you know, multiple thousand degree gases blowing into the inside of the wing. This is starting to soften the struts, the structural support of yeah. the wing. Okay. It, they're not melted exactly, but they're starting to get kind of 
wobbly wobbly. Well, I, and that, and that, and now you blow up the tires. Well, I want to stop you right there because I want to explain to people what a pla- I mean, a plasma is what think about the plasma, and I don't know what the temperatures that we're talking about, but it's the same thing that you. This is not like you know. <laughs> how do I say this? Jet fuel burning steel. This is not that same scenario. No. This is a cutting torch. This, this, per, yes, this, yes, this, yes, this, yes. This definitely, no one is going to argue with you that this is what we use. And I'm sure the plasma on reentry is probably hotter than the plasma that you can produce on the ground to cut steel in half anyways. So, I mean, that's what's going up inside this wing, inside this uh, this wheel well is basically a cutting. It's Think of it as a person up there with a cutting torch just cutting away. Yes, basically. Yeah. Now, so, so, but it, but it hasn't cut through yet. Um, but now you blow up the tires, and so it's soft, and so the the wing just tore apart. Yeah. So now you've got a shuttle which is a flying brick anyway, flying brick with wings. Yeah. And now one of the wings is gone. And it lost all aerodynamic stability and went into an uncontrolled tumble at something like Mach 18. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it, it, yeah, it's going to get shredded. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's exactly. And that's, that's exactly what happened. What, uh, you know, that was one thing you, you talked about the cowboy space movie. That was one thing I always thought was bunk. Because you can't eject, a human body can't handle the forces of ejecting at, at speed of sound, can they? Um, can and has really, but the th- but the thing that you have to realize is if you pay attention to that movie, they slow it way down. There is a specific procedure involved, yeah, in order in order to do a bailout from the shuttle. Okay. Um, that you got to slow it way down and you got to be down below a certain altitude and the, the, you hook on to a, a rod that extends out and below yeah, the so wing. You, yeah. So you don't hit back into the, into the shuttle. Bingo. Yeah. Right. So it, you, you, you go out on that and it slings you down below the shuttle. Yeah. I mean, that, so, that makes sense. I, I just, I'm just wondering, well, I guess they're trained though, or they yes. maybe have the straps on their things that keep their limbs because it, I don't think, because I've jumped off of a high dive. I mean, we're talking one of the Olympic high dive, the platforms as a kid. I didn't, and, I didn't say you were going to come through it unscathed. Oh, well, yeah. Oh, yeah, but metal. you'll come through it. But you should come through it alive. Gotcha. I, yeah, that, because like, like I said, I, I, I've done I've done that, and there's times where you can't. Once you're, if you don't hold your, just jumping off a platform diving board, if you don't hold your hands or arms in as you're uh-huh. going straight down, if you hold them out, you've got to let them go all the way up because if you hit that water with your arms, you know, in a cross move, you're you're going to break something. Yep, and and even at that height, it, you know, which is not that that tall because of the just sheer force. But wow, it, it, it's so so. But the, so there are a lot of there there are a lot of requirements for a bailout to it, it, before you even can attempt a bailout procedure. Mm-hmm. The the shuttle has to be in in what's what we call airplane mode, which sure. means belly to the ground, nose for nose forward. Um, it doesn't necessarily fly like that on orbit. Yeah. <laughs> it it can fly belly to the sky, tail first if it wants to. Well, most of the time, no, no atmosphere. Well, most of the time that you see the shuttle and stuff, they're upside down to protect the, the astronauts from the radiation and from the sun. No, it's uh, much simpler than that. Oh. They're just looking. They're looking at the ground. Oh, is that what? It is? They they got stuff in the payload bay. They want to they want to observe the ground. Oh. So that's that's their, so they so they turn. Belly out, so you can get a good. No matter where you are, you got a good look at the at the Earth. Um, they fly tail first these days. They used to fly nose first, but these days they fly tail first because they've begun. They began realize. Well, they don't do any of it anymore because yeah. the shuttles are tired. But um, they began flying tail first because um, there's a whole lot less vulnerable stuff in the tail, and we began realizing that there was enough. Uh, debris in orbit to pose a danger. Yeah. Like the first time we came home with a ding in the in the the windshield. The windshield, yeah. From from a paint chip. 
Yeah, I, I, I remember my brother saying at one time that those things are in space are traveling at supersonic speed. Oh yeah, they're it, traveling at tens of thousands of miles an hour. Yeah, and they and and they, you know, pieces and. Do you ever see that becoming a problem? You know, the movie Gravity. I actually see that being a, a, a huge issue. I mean, if I was a a rogue nation and I wanted to mess everybody up, economies up, because we are so satellite dependent now, I just shoot a rocket up in the thing and just blow it up. Oh, it's even simpler than that. But I can't really go there because classified. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, uh, but but yeah. Um, actually, don't get me started on gravity because bunk them. Oh, uh, I, there, there were there was so much science wrong with that movie. I didn't. I couldn't even I, go see. I agree. I, I saw the the trailer in the theater, and I just I wanted to throw throw something yeah. at the screen. Yeah. The only the only thing that I that I you know it was it was an entertaining thing, but the only thing that I. Yeah, it was filled full of a lot of a lot of liberty, and and um, and then, and then I ha- I wound wound up with people you know talking to me on social media. Wasn't that fantastic? Uh, I didn't know you could do such and such. Well, you can't. You well, can't. what do you mean they showed it in the movie? Well, yeah, I'm sorry, the movie was wrong. No, it wasn't. It was a movie. Yeah. You know they had they had NASA even liked it. No, NASA didn't say anything like that. Yeah, didn't say anything. Yeah, I don't I don't think they did. And, you know, let's let's talk about movies. Have you seen? I mean, there's this one video that's out there, and I, I'm going to tell people right now that, are, that have watched it on YouTube, and I know a lot of you guys that watch my show have also watched and seen this video because you guys have asked about it about the Columbia and the fact that it ran in or got into a a a, a fight with a UFO. I will tell you, hands down, that that is all CGI. Someone put that together. Uh, you know, great special effects, but I, I think you're treading on the on the death of of our heroes, and <laughs> yeah. shame on you for doing that because yeah. it is CGI, and I can tell you it's CGI, and the reason being is because there is no NASA logo on the port or starboard side of the space shuttle, and it clearly shows in their in the video that they show after the apparent attack, the side of the shuttle floating by you with a you know it says United States of America with a flag. And yep. it has the NASA logo on it, and, and that's not there. That is not there. That is not on the ship. Uh, that it, you uh, know, that someone took liberty and yep. put that in there, and 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 you don't want me to find them. Yeah, shame on you, exactly for doing uh, that because you know you could do whatever, but th- that that was a tragedy. People lost their lives, and for you to put a video uh, out like that so you can get your hits or prove your your prowess, all you proved to me is you were a jerk. Well, I'll tell you, my husband is a graphics artist, mm-hmm. and uh, in in fact, um, long story, but uh, he wound up uh, because he did some artwork for my my website. Several publishers uh, now come to him for cover art, so much of my own cover art for my books uh, is his work. Um, but he's taught me how to look at. I'm I, I'm I'm not quite as good with. Um, with video as I am with still pictures, but I can pull a still picture in and look at it, and I can tell you f- within probably ninety percent accuracy if it's been photoshopped or not. Yeah. And all invariably, when it's something like that, it's been photoshopped. Yeah. Now I do have to ask: there was a video that was put out of the Columbia as as they were uh, descending. Um, that. They said there was the video, and then it went blank. Is that is that a true video? Do you know I the one I'm talking about? I, no, I don't. Okay, I'm not. I don't know the one you're talking about. Yeah, so. the, there was one out there where you actually have an. It's an inside uh, image uh, of of the shuttle as it's descending. But the only problem that I have oh, with that is, I, I, uh, I will I will tell you, no, that's not that's not legit. Okay. Um, there there have been other shuttle missions where they did take. A video through the cockpit windows yeah. uh, of of the the you could see the plasma, uh, you know, and 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 all that kind of stuff. But um, if it sounds like somebody got hold of one of those and edited it, yeah, because I I couldn't see. This is my thing. Yeah, it's got to be an internal video that has it written because you can't broadcast through that plasma as the ship. No, as you the, can't. As the shuttle's coming down, that plas as the atmosphere is it's. 
as it's doing it, it there's you can't even get a signal out. Right. And and it's my understanding, it, we, based upon what was left of the shuttle after it came through the atmosphere, is you, you weren't going to pick up a you know a camcorder. No. There wasn't going to nope. be a camcorder to pick up. You got it. Um, in fact, the way I found out what was going on, um, I very clearly remember it was a Saturday morning. Yep. Um, my husband had recently had heart surgery and we were sleeping in, um, because that's kind of a intensive sort of thing. And he was exhausted and I was not far behind and we got up. And I came into the den, grabbed the TV remote, turned the TV on, it came onto the Weather Channel. Mm-hmm. Um, and even the 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 announcer was saying, it came in in mid mid sentence. And Space Shuttle Columbia is 12 minutes late, emerging from the reentry com blackout. And I just I just went, oh crap. Um, yeah. Because I knew what that meant. I mean, 12 seconds would have been pushing it, but 12 minutes. So I turned and I yelled down the hall towards the bedroom, which in retrospect, what I yelled is probably not the right thing to have done to a heart patient. But I yelled, honey, get in here. We've lost a shuttle. Yeah. And um, so, I mean, yeah, it's it's that is standard. You have the plasma prevents broadcast. Yeah. It's not you're not going to get it uh, live. The best you can hope for is um, getting a recording later on. And like you said, the thing came apart at the seams. And so you're not going to have a camcorder surviving that. Yeah. Yeah. There, I don't even, I, what's the biggest piece that they found? Oh, geez. I, I, I don't know offhand. Um, the biggest piece that I've seen is on order of maybe. Maybe the size of a car door. Yeah, I mean, yeah, and they're... and and it, and it was pretty obvious that was a that was a piece of the fuselage, not an interior piece. Yeah. So yeah, it, it's it, it's. It, that said, um, it's my understanding that at least one crew member was found on the ground. Body relatively intact, cause of death, multiple blunt force traumas. From the explosion. It didn't explode. Well, the, 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 the breakup. The breakup. Uh, uh, it, 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 we're not sure. I, I actually wound up, I got to talk to a field coroner and he kind of gave me, I, I asked him about that and, he didn't he didn't actually say anything um he his his bo- he used his body language and gestures and so what he did was he shrugged and then he nodded because what i had asked him was was he beaten to death by the debris as it broke up around him or did he die when he hit And so his first response, the first part of that was to shrug, and then he nodded. And then he said, we weren't there, so we'll never know for sure. Hmm. Hmm. So the the official line was that they died virtually instantly as the shuttle went into this violent tumble and broke apart. Hmm. And I really hope that that is the correct I hope that's what happened. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's still there's still pieces to be. I mean, they they still haven't. This wasn't like the Challenger in which they knew where the debris fell and they were watching it. I mean, oh yeah, this fell over. This fell over multiple multiple states, even. So never mind counties. Yeah. And a, and a good stretch of the debris field was in Texas, and Texas is huge. Yeah. And it started breaking up before it got to Texas. So, yeah, uh, there there are pieces we will never recover. Hmm. There are pieces that people found and squirreled away. Yeah. There are pieces that people found and 
treated with honor and basically buried. Buried them. Yeah. 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 So they they gave it a burial. So. Yeah, I, I I remember I was cooking pancakes. You know, Saturday morning I was cooking pancakes for my youngest daughter, and I just flipped on the news and and saw you know saw kind of like the meteorite kind of image yeah. where you yeah. can see it, and it was, and then they they came back and said that that was that was that was they, Columbia. They they had a um, the guys the poor guys in in Houston at uh, the MCC. Um, all they knew is that they they weren't getting telemetry when they should have been getting telemetry. You know, the, you have the you have the reentry com blackout, but then when it emerges, once it gets down to the point where it's slowed down enough to where the plasma starts to dissipate, then you start being able to communicate again, and that didn't happen, and they couldn't raise them. And they couldn't figure out what was going on, and that's that's a it's a big honking building with no windows, and they couldn't even see out. Yeah. And it wasn't until they start pe- relatives and friends started calling them on console and saying turn on the TV because so and so got a video of it, and now it's playing on channel whatever. Hmm. And then they went, oh crap, you got to be kidding. Now, when they have events like that, does NASA, do they actually sequester? Do they actually lock down? I, I saw that in a movie. I wanted to ask you. Do they actually- yes, yes, yes. Okay. And it's in, my, it's in my book. And the reason they do it is because they want to freeze every. See, we've got software. We've got console logs. We've got, you know, all d- telemetry data and all this other stuff. We want to freeze everything as it was at the moment that the disaster occurred. Because that is part of the forensics. That's part of figuring out what happened and why. I mean, are they? Are, is your experience at NASA really wants to know why, or do they want to withhold it? Oh, is it is it a uh, containment of information as well? It, no, it is. It, we want to know what happened. Okay. We want to know what happened. We we need to know what happened so we can prevent it from happening ever again. Okay. I mean that, that that's fair. I mean I, I well, always wondered if it was a, if they really uh, you know because data is data and it's always going to be there. So yeah. the, this whole mirror of locking everything down, I always thought that was kabuki theater. No, it's not okay. because you, you've got you've got computers running. You don't want to overwrite stuff. You don't want to inadvertently erase something. You don't want um, somebody to to inadvertently wipe a disk that shouldn't have been wiped. <laughs> or or scribble out an entry in a log, um, or for that matter, if it was somebody that did something stupid and they know they did something stupid, and it was their fault, you don't want them going back and modifying things to make it look like it wasn't their fault. Yeah, talking talking yeah. about overriding something, you know, the the disk drives for the Apollo missions. You know, I I still find that hard to believe when. We go back and you file the freedom. Of, they tell you that the that the the original the original audio and the original video and all that has been overwritten or destroyed. They can't find. Well, uh, the first thing that you have to remember is that the the recording methods back then we're talking late sixties here. Yeah. The recording methods were extremely different from what they are today. And they were much less robust. You had mag tape, you had punch cards, and 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 not much else. Yeah. And so, if you no longer have, you know, a mag tape is is easy to accidentally derez. A and and the the celluloid it's on, I call it celluloid. It's it's not, but the stuff that it's on deteriorates over time. Mm-hmm. Um, if, if you don't have a punch card reader anymore, forget that, you know, um, film is the same way. So you basically what we've got is we got a situation. Remember, it's been, we're pushing what, 50 years. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so, so forget the fact that modern technology doesn't read it anymore. 
I mean, heck, I had I went back here this past summer and tried to recover. I, I did manage it with a lot of help from my husband, but I had I wanted to recover some old manuscripts that I had written and had kind of just shoved away in a corner um, and not done anything with. I wanted to bring them out and rewrite them and polish them up and do something with them. Yeah. Well, you know, I almost couldn't do it because the it was like 1998. Yeah, the format was different. Yeah, the, you know, if you wrote it in WordStar or whatever, and I, I, you, I couldn't, I couldn't find anything that would access a floppy drive. That's right. That's true too. So, a seven, we're coming up a great conversation because the time has gotten away from us. We're coming up on another hard break, so we'll take a break and uh, we're talking with our very special guest. Stephanie Osborne is joining us on Skype. You know, and to that point, you know, the New Jersey train, they just finally said even the black box on the New Jersey train, they had to ship back to the manufacturer because they had no way, NTSB had no way of reading it. But uh, we're going to start getting into a little bit more of the edgy topics. I'll just cue him out here. I can do that. So we're going to get a little bit more of the edgy topics. I've got some some questions on some video, and uh, I want to get Stephanie's opinion on it. The other thing, too, is, uh, you know, we'll talk about her books, what she's doing, some of the the projects that she's working on currently and in the future. And uh, so hang in there. We're going to take a four-minute break. When we get back, we will be talking with our very special guest, Stephanie Osborne.
the Midnight Ocean with Jeff Norton on the Paranormal State Radio Network. That is right, Andrew, as we roll on in to the evening. I think we've taken this ship as far out as we want to go tonight. We're going to come on back to the docks here, you know, head on back home. <laughs> Hang in there with us. We got two more hours, though, with our very special guest, Stephanie Osborne. I don't want to keep her too long, but she informed me that she is a night owl like the rest of us. So uh, I will be sure to occupy two more hours of her time. I've got I've got a ton of questions. It's not very often you get a legitimate space scientist on, on the show. And I hope we're not boring her with, with our questions. But if you have a question for our guest, Stephanie, you can actually uh, SMS, SMS, text message those to us. The, the text message number is 786-574-3652. That's 786-574-3652. Or, of course, if you're in YouTube chat or in the comments section there on Facebook, you can ask your question there. I have a screen that kind of doesn't merge them together, but I can watch both of them at the same time. And I'll be sure to ask the question of our of our guest. And if you are joining us for the very first time on YouTube, make sure you you uh, hit that ever so most important subscribe button. If you're joining us for Facebook, I, I do notice that the, the video looks a little sketchy there. It, it, it's like blocky. I don't know. I, I think they're still working on their technology and and everything with the live feed. But uh, like I said, you can always join us on YouTube or if you want to see my ugly mug. Or, of course, you can download the Android app or the iPhone app and you can uh, uh, watch us or listen to us there. And if you want to listen to us on the uh, on the Internet, you can do that through Spreaker and, and all the various sites. But I'd, I'd highly recommend Spreaker. Spreaker. That seems to be the very stable, stable of them all. Got to remember, we're radio <laughs> podcast, not necessarily video. Video was secondary, but it seems to be doing us oh, okay these days. So it, it was funny because as we were on break, I was sitting there playing, uh, as we would say, Jewish. <laughs> it's like, Stephanie, Jewish geography. Stephanie, do you know these people? <laughs> and I'm naming out names of people and, and everything. Yeah. So, yeah, Michael, I'm not going to say his last name. On the air, he was actually in propulsions as well. Uh, I think he still works with GE Power, though. He's with GE now on okay. their on their aerospace. But, yeah, they were all – man, you guys down there, I remember some good – like I said, I was four years younger than my brother, and when he moved to Alabama, I will have to say if, that was Geekville, USA. Oh yes, oh, I yes. The it. Rocket City is very definitely Geekville. I loved it. <clears throat> it was. I remember playing battle chess with a professor, and <laughs> you know, <laughs> and this guy. And I remember hanging out with guys that are, uh, you know, at the very top, especially at UTSI. I, you know, um, I actually Michael's father was a professor there. And uh, I remember him giving me this. It was funny because you go to his house and you think you're going to get a lecture on mathematics and physics and, and everything. And, and he brings out his uh, collection of uh, of pipes, Crimshaw pipes or whatever, you know, or oh, cool. track. And he's and he's proud of these pipes. And I'm, I'm like, I'm, I'm here for the math lecture, man. I'm here for the, I'm here for the for the unified theory <laughs> course. You know, I want to know. And I was always that guy. That's why I think I was meant to do this type of show because I was always fascinated by the science and I could just sit for days, if not you know, just days listening to these guys lecture their lectures. And I don't care about no degree. <laughs> I would just sit in a room and listen to them talk and uh, pick up on it. that's, it, that's the one that I do miss about not being in Chicago because on Saturday and Sunday, they would at the physics lab at University of Chicago, they would always have a guest speaker. And, you know, it would be astrophysics, it would be whatever. And you sit and it's free, open to the public. And you can sit in here and, and listen to these, these guys that are science rock stars. Or you can go out to Fermi lab, they'd let you go out to Fermi as well. And you could sit and listen to these lectures and free of charge, free of charge. Cool. But now you can't do that because of security reasons. Oh uh, yeah, 
Uh, it's 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 crazy. Uh, so yeah, before we take, I, I want to kind of move off of off of the sh- you know shuttle, and I and I appreciate you taking the time. I know it is a a subject that that is near and dear to your heart because you did lose a a very good friend there, and and stuff. And I do want to move on more to the crazy stuff. <laughs> we're, okay. We're after the hours and we're, we're heading back to the dock. So now I don't have to worry. Um, so I let's start talking about the, this whole thing about NASA turning off its video when it sees strange things in the background. What is, what, what do you think that's all about? Well, uh, what, what is really going on there is a case of, Usually it's a case of, oh my gosh, are we venting something? Um, have we lost a piece of the spacecraft? You know, think about Apollo 13 for a minute. Think about the, the piece of flashing floating away from the Columbia. Um, there, you don't want the families of the astronauts finding out, oh crap, things just went to, you know, we're in a handbasket by watching the TV news. That makes it's, sense. It's that simple. So I never, it's the whole Occam's razor theory. You know, it's the simplest answer. And that actually, that, that's the first time I've ever heard that, that anybody ever said that, that, yeah, I mean, you're, you're watching a piece float off into space. Well, that piece had to come from somewhere. Yeah. And, and how, and how vital was it? And how, <laughs> and, 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 you know, I mean, the guys on Apollo 13, they really all they knew was they could see stuff venting. They yeah. could see they could and of course as the stuff came out it was crystallizing. Um so it was it was flashy, it was shiny. Um but they didn't really know how bad it was until um they they got ready to to re enter and detached from the service module. And then they there <clears throat> I think they do have some pictures. Mm-hmm. That you can that you can look at, but uh, I mean, it was. Well, I think they just declassified, like within the last month, some video. Well, the, NASA doesn't have a classification scheme. Oh, no, it doesn't. That's that is a common misconception. NASA is not military. It does not have a classification scheme. Thing NASA stuff is not classified. Oh, now if if if. One of the branches of the military has asked NASA to carry a classified payload. Mm -hmm. Then that payload is classified and it is handled appropriately, but the classification goes through the branch of the military whose payload it is. NASA itself does not have a classification scheme at all. Did not know that. See, I learned that. So, so you can basically walk into their archives at any given time and say, give me this, or do you still have to go through a freedom of information request, a FOIA request? No, no, you can, they've got, you can go dig stuff out of their archives. Wow. And most, most of the stuff that they have still extant that can be scanned and put up on the web has been. Hmm. Okay. I mean, I did I didn't know that. I mean, that that's something I've learned. You know, from from it, the show, that's awesome. It it is it is a common. I get that a lot. Well, mm-hmm. what they, they've got it classified. Well, no, because NASA doesn't have a classification system. So you know, it it doesn't. You don't have um, when when you come on board with NASA, they do do a very rudimentary background check. If you become a teacher, they do a rudimentary background check. Yeah, they just want to make sure that you're. An okay person, yeah. you know, because you're being put in a position of trust. You've got astronauts' lives in your hands. Yeah, uh, so, yeah, it's basic stuff. Right. But other than that, there isn't anything. And believe me, I've worked DOD classified projects, okay? I know from classified projects. But that comes and through. That be, That's the military. Like you said, that is the military. That, exactly. That requires, yeah, because my... My classification actually came through the Army. My classification lapsed when I went to NASA. Really? Now, the, now yeah, because I didn't need it. 
And they and they didn't renew it. And well, because they didn't. there was yeah, they, there was no need to. Yeah. But now the interesting thing is that when I started doing DOD work again, when I transferred away from NASA and started doing DOD work again, because I worked for a contractor, not mm-hmm. directly, not I wasn't a civil servant. So when I started doing DOD work again, the fact that I had been with NASA for all those years meant that, you know, my my re up on the classification came through in like two weeks. Oh, wow. Or something, something ridiculous like that, yeah. So, um, because I, they, they knew where I'd been all that time. Yeah. You know, I was working on a government project. Yeah, they just probably pulled your finances or whatever, you know, and your gambling or whatever. If you, yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> you hit the Mississippi Queen a couple times, and uh, no, I, you no, know, I, it, it, I know, I, it, I, we laugh about it, but I've seen more guys like when I was working with the Fifth CST. On, on their program and, and the research that we were doing there, well, not the research, but writing the software. I saw more guys get, get their classifications yanked, Army guys, because mm-hmm. they would go to the casinos. Oh, geez. Now, and I'm, um, like, I'm like, you know, come on, knuckleheads. I mean, it, you know that's one of the things they look at, and uh, it's part of your financial profile. It's not saying that you can't go to the casino or whatever, but if you make a habit of it, they're definitely yeah. going to, you know, you're going to raise some flags. And, so, yeah. so yeah, no, yeah, that's that's about the extent of it. And I had a husband who was who was working as a government contractor, and sure. I had um a um, brother-in-law who was uh, Navy at the time, and you know, it it was just not something that was a big deal for them to check me out. Yeah, because you know, it's pretty much open book here. You know. Yeah. No. It. It. it and that. Like I said, when I went through the process, I thought, you know, the whole thing, I was in a center room and, and then, you know, family were going to get picked on. And so it wasn't like that at all. It wasn't. Mm-mm. I mean, they, they, they do the standard stuff. And one thing I learned about when, when I went through it, I, you know, the, the guy I was working for a company as a government contractor and, and he sat down and he said, just be honest. I'm, you know, when you fill out the forms, be honest. He said, because what they're looking for is the untruthfulness. If you're honest right. with them, if you're oh. honest with them and say, yeah, I did this or I did that or I did, you know, this is because he goes, they already know the answer, Jeff. Yeah. <laughs> and what they're looking for is to see how untruthful you are. Now, when they catch you in, in a couple in deception, then they start digging a little bit deeper. You yep. know, and then then you have uh, FBI agents knocking on families and teachers doors and, you know, ask, asking well, a lot of questions. Even 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 with DOD stuff. Mm-hmm. You're you're looking. It's it's a safety issue. You've yeah. got soldiers' lives at risk. That's right. You've got you've got um you, you've got intelligence agents' lives at risk. Right. You've got um ultimately the the populace as a whole of the nation. Yeah, yeah. And so they're looking. Are you trustworthy? Yeah. Are you somebody we can trust with our people? Are you somebody we can trust with our information? Yep. Are you somebody we can trust to do the right thing? Yeah. Well, like like I said, we designed with the fifth COT, and actually this goes back to some of some of your background. We designed the critical incident management system that the uh, that Homeland. Well, there was different different divisions. Actually, it was several companies, uh, you know, applying or trying to get the contract, and I just happened to work for one of the primaries, and uh-huh. uh, and we designed the 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 critical, you know, the 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 Sims, what they call Sims system with the uh out of out of illinois and uh it was basically the software that directs resources if they're in the event of a nuclear biological or you know a threat happen uh you know our mm-hmm. software is the one because you got to remember there's a lot of logistics there's a lot of things moving um a lot of parts moving there's a lot of agencies that have to be yep. alerted there's you know we, we were working with the national and that was the thing that impressed out of all of this project and I saw that you were a National Weather Service uh, storm certified storm spot. I will have to tell you, the guys at if if I could go to any agency to work, I would go work for the National Weather Service. They have <laughs> some just incredible. You know, we were playing. Here we go. We were playing audio last night or two nights ago of UFOs, and and these were nine one one reports. And of course, they're calling the tower. The police are calling the tower on one of them. An aircraft, the AT, the 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 ATB, the the tower's like, we don't see nothing. 
Well, then at another one, they called the National Weather Service. And the National Weather Service is like, yeah, he goes, I'm I'm pinging this object. And it's, you know, there's six of them and they're traveling at this speed. And I mean, <laughs> and, and just lets you know what, what the National Weather Service has at its disposal. And uh, I know a lot of conspiracy theorists, I want to say this, that listen to our show. You know, one of the things you heard about the National Weather Service buying, you know, two million rounds of ammo. And everybody's like, why does the National Weather Service need 2 million rounds of ammo? Think about what they control. Basically, all of our satellites. They, the National Weather Service has no, the ability. Say, no, no not, not where nearly all of not our all, satellites. Not the military, but they have the ability to, and there's certain, there's certain uplink centers that they are in control of that, you know, and they have a private guard system. Because you could wreak, and going back to what we were talking about earlier, sabotage. You could wreak havoc if you just get one or two satellites and you break into a facility and and you and you deorbit it or you cause it to tumble in space or whatever, and and you can knock out a lot of a lot of things. And uh, so, yes, I, I I like the fact that those guys have guns <laughs> are protecting our resources. Huh. Well. I mean, it goes, it does. So enough of that, enough of the conspiracy talk. Let's get back to some more, con- some other conspiracy talk. Um, SpaceX. Oh, okay. Did, did you hear, what are your feelings on uh, Elon? They're not ruling out sabotage. Uh, well, if anytime you have a problem, you need to, um, you need to check it. Yeah. And yeah, I, I would I would say uh, it's it's early um, early stages to be ruling out anything at this point. Yeah, it was. Um, it, it was that, that said, is it likely? Probably not, yeah. but it's definitely worth a look see. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, like I said, I, I was watching. Being in Florida, we watch those those launches all the time, and I love them. Mm-hmm. And oh, yeah. I, I was watching the live feed, like here in Florida. For those that don't know, when they have a launch, when they have a launch, all of the local stations go to that launch. It's kind of like a big event here, and and they treat it as such. And so I was watching when they were doing the test, and it, well, it wasn't a launch when they were doing the test. And like I said, they, anytime they feed anything from the K, you know, from the K or the launch pad, it, it goes instantly out to the, to all of our local stations. Now you guys don't mm-hmm. see it outside unless it's, unless something blows up. I can tell you, I well, was watching on channel five here in Florida, them doing that. And David, who were the newscaster let's local here was talking about it when it blew up and, and I didn't see. And when the video came out, I didn't see, you know, they're talking about a drone flying by i didn't see that in the original video i think that was someone cgi once again yeah added that i i i I saw that video and yes i can tell you it was cgi yeah i mean i i i I took a look at it Uh, somebody somebody said hey steph have you seen this what do you make of it and so i took a close look at it it was cgi It, it absolutely and People don't realize you can't come within a mile or so of the Cape in the water. Oh, you can't come within many miles of the Cape in the air. In the air, exactly. I mean, in the water. It's on a, it's, it's on a freaking um, um, air base. Uh, air station. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, no, you, and it's you're not going to be flying a drone without yeah, them knowing. Yeah. yeah, it's restricted airspace. They, that, that thing had come in there for real. They'd have shot that sucker yeah. down. Well, they had one incident, you know, where they were the last SpaceX when they they actually canceled it because some idiot in a boat uh, got too close, and they and they that tells you how stick. I mean, the the guy was just a pleasure craft, and he was in a boat with his family. And you want to know why they why it has a restricted water area, right? Well, for debris, right? Correct. Exactly. Yeah, they keep I mean, you from you getting hurt. Yeah, you don't want some, you know, somebody's out there fishing or whatever, or in his, or 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 water skiing or whatever, and all it wants the pieces of a rocket land on him and yeah. kill him. Yeah, you know yeah. that's not that's not a good thing. Yeah, when those, yeah, when things blow up, they tend to go out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But well, that, that's the whole reason why they they have 
the launch facilities where they do mm-hmm. is because it's it's literally pretty much right on the beach. So, you know, it travels a few tens of yards and then it's over water. Yeah. So there's no population. And I tell you that one of the one of the most gut wrenching things I have ever seen in my life. The first time I had occasion to go to Houston on business, um, I got a chance to, I I was given a tour of the mission control room. And at that point in time, they were still using the one from Apollo days. So that felt like full circle to me. But there is a a position called the range safety officer. Mm -hmm. And as soon as you hear... um, the, the shuttle has cleared the tower or the spacecraft has cleared the tower or whatever. That means that's handover. That's handover from launch control at the Cape to mission control at Houston. At that point, Houston has control. So as soon as it, it gets clear of, of the launch tower, Houston's got it. The range safety officers at Houston, there is on the range safety officers console, there is a red button shielded under a plexiglass case and the case lifts up it's hinged it lifts up Mm -hmm. in the event that the spacecraft goes out of control and it doesn't matter if it's the shuttle or it or or an unmanned spacecraft or whatever um and it appears that we have lost all control and that it may fall on populated areas uh there are pyrotechnics wired all through the system, and it is the range safety officer's responsibility to determine if there is a threat to the populace. He or she will lift the plexiglass lid and slam his or her hand down on the red button and blow the spacecraft to kingdom come. Yeah. Yep. And most people don't realize that. And I knew as soon as I saw it, I just... I just uh, a, an ice cold hand reached into my guts and grabbed a fistful, and I said, "This is not a job I, I will ever want." To be in charge of that. Well, they, they I, and there was, I, I believe, it was one of the Al, Alan Moss, one of his his space. They had an abnormality, and in one of the one of the the lifts, and the range safety officer officer blew it up. It didn't blow up on its own. I mean, a lot of people think that those rockets blow up on their own when they're flying. No, they're blown up. As you yeah. said, if they're if they are in air, then chances are, yeah, the range safety officer blows them up. Blows them up. Yep. Because yeah, and they, they, that's that's not what happened to Challenger. No. But, but yeah. No, no, that one that one disintegrated before I think they could determine, and and I I don't think because they actually shot that one. I mean, they shoot them over the ocean. It's not like they right. they shoot them over land. But I believe there was an issue. Where one of Musk's, one of Elon's uh, rockets, one of the propulsions, they couldn't get it to to turn. You know how it does that roll or that turn. They couldn't get it to turn, and thus it was coming. They were concerned that with with winds and prevailing winds and all of that stuff, so they just blew it up. He wasn't well, happy, it, but yeah, well, uh, but but sometimes it happens. So. Well, they have to because you got. It, I mean, you the, got. The sp- the spin is part of the of the uh, uh, of the control. If it's spinning, then then it's moving forward and it's not going to wobble. Hmm. It's kind of a gyroscopic kind of a thing. Gotcha. Um, but but yeah. So if if it is not spinning and it's supposed to, then you don't have good control over it and you're in trouble. Yeah, you gotta let it go. It, you know, talk about SpaceX. Now the thing is, is I guess IAU. Uh, was requested, uh, SpaceX a- asked to investigate IAU, and, and IAU said no. They had a building that was a mile away, and uh, th- there's a theory now, or, or you yeah, know, and this is all conspiracy stuff, that someone might have taken a shot at it from the top of their building. And uh, so they sent, uh, I think Air Force uh, OSI went out there to investigate. They couldn't, they, I, I'm waiting to see what comes back. But I will tell you, I mean, it, it took out the pad. That's the problem. Oh, Forget boy. about the rocket. Yeah. It took out the yeah. whole facility. Yeah, it took out the infrastructure, and that's a problem. Yeah, because so I, you've got to rebuild that before you can do anything yeah. else. I mean, Elon will rebuild, have the rocket rebuilt before <laughs> before the pad's ready to go. Oh, but yeah. we got 
another great conversation. There you go. Another segment just blew by us. So we'll take another quick four minute break. And then when we get back, we'll continue our conversation. I promise, guys, you in the chat room, I will, I, I promise that I will ask <laughs> Stephanie. I think you already know the answer, though, about flat earthers. But this is the Midnight Ocean Radio Show and podcast. Hang in there with us as we cruise on into the. This is the Midnight Ocean with Jeff Norton on the Paranormal State Radio Network. with Jeff Norton on the Paranormal State Radio Network. Welcome, welcome. (laughs) Oh, what an interesting conversation. We've covered a lot of topics tonight. I hope we get them all in. And uh, with our very special 
guest, Stephanie Osborne. If you guys have a question for Stephanie, please make sure that you get it into the chat room or you can text message it to me at 786-574-3652. If you're joining us for the very first time on YouTube, thank you very much. Make sure that you hit that subscribe button. Also tell your friends about us. If you're joining us on Facebook, we would greatly appreciate it if you share the show on your pages and on your posts and such. We have a special treat for you guys. At the end of the, on Friday, what we're going to do is we're going to tally up who shared us the most, and I will call you out on the show, give you kudos, but more importantly, I'll reach out to you and get your information. I have a very special gift that we, gift 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 that we're going to be sending you to say thank you. It looks a little sketchy out there in Facebook. I, I do apologize. Well, I can't apologize. I don't control it, so I can't control the video quality. But if you ever want to jump over, you can come over to YouTube. The audio, the the audio and video quality there is pretty rock solid. Uh, that's what they do. So you expect it to be good quality where YouTube is more of a, or Facebook is more of a social media site. So, and I think they're still working out their, their kinks. Oh, I believe that pretty much covers all of the housekeeping that I have for you guys. So let's get back to our guest. And I do promise, <laughs> I do promise Stephanie, this is my last question. I, you know, I, I, it, it's kind of, I kind of feel like the, the attorney here or whatever. And I'm just asking you, peppering you with a bunch of questions, but I already know the answer to this one. I'm, I'm just going to, but I have to ask it because I okay. promise, I promised people last night, we had a heated discussion about flat earth last night. And I, no, I, no, I don't. <laughs> okay. Enough said. <laughs> <laughs> Enough I mean, said. okay. Okay. If, if, if there are so many problems with, it. for instance, you can't make eclipses work. I don't care how hard you try. Yeah. Um, you certainly are not going to get a round uh, slice shadow out of the moon um, right. or the sun from the moon. Um, you know, there, there's just so many problems. No, just uh, no. You don't even want to no. go there. Yeah. I, I don't mean, even want to go it, there. It hurts your head. It hurts your head. Well, here's one that might might be interesting though. You, you know, you you mentioned it, the moon. Uh, you know, what are your what is your feeling about the moon? And let me tell you why. Because after the Apollo missions, I did not know this until I I did some research. I was listening. I was watching a show on History Channel where they said the moon rang after you know when it when it hit when they deorbited the uh, the command console or whatever the the orbiter mm -hmm. there. Yeah. That the moon that that it rang and they're like, you know, that means it's hollow. No. Okay. It just means it's vibrating. Okay. Uh, we we the gravitational distribution would be much much different if it were a hollow sphere. Uh -huh. Uh, and and so we know we we can tell we can even tell where the density of the rock changes because the the uh, um, orbit of Apollo or of the various and sundry uh, probes that we've put into orbit around it varies a little bit, goes up or down, depending on the density of the, of the rock underneath it as you pass over it. Mm -hmm. So we, we would have, we would know just from the orbital mechanics if it were hollow. No. Um, any, a bell rings because it's vibrating. Um, the earth rings when you have a massive earthquake. The, um, the, the, some of the, the big, really big earthquakes, it's easily detectable. Okay. Uh, the, like the, the, uh, Boxing Day quake that where they had the big tsunami in the Indian Ocean. Um, the earth rang. Uh, but it's not hollow. But it's not it's, hollow. It, yeah, it's just vibrating from from the forces at work. Gotcha. So, what would you say to those people that you know? And I, and I was looking at this, and you know, you have large craters and small craters, but they all seem to be at the same depth. What explains that? Um, there are a number of different things that could explain it. Um, if they happened to be made at largely the same time, 
if you happened to have something that was causing them to slump, if they tended and probably did tend to melt the rock, uh, then it could partially fill in the crater before solidifying again. Um, you know, there's, there's all kinds of, and it's not just the moon that does that. You, you go looking at any of the planets with with obvious craters and they they all look pretty much the same. Hmm. Okay. It's 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 a matter of geology. It's there's nothing weird. There's nothing not okay. Cuz I always like I said I watched that show and I was like, "What? I never heard of the ringing part. I never heard of the you know, the fact that it was uh um well, that the craters remember? being large or small, but they're always the same depth and then the other argument they made is the fact that it that the, the, the placement of the moon is very pecu- peculiar in the sense well, that it's it's the perfect size to create an eclipse. It's the perfect distance from the Earth to create a perfect eclipse, which they say it's never done. That's that's the, the that's orbital mechanics at play. That's stability. That's it's yeah. Um, I also would like to point out that all of the craters are not actually at exactly the same depth because you have craters within craters. Oh. So, ah, yeah. Ah, see. Mm-hmm. So. All right. Um, but, but that said, uh, let's go back to the ringing for a second because <laughs> the the moon, because it is a solid, undifferentiated, relatively undifferentiated body, um, is going to ring easier than Earth. Now, what I mean by, by that is the Earth has layers. It has a crust. It has a mantle. It has an uh, outer core. It has an inner core. And these are different materials with different properties. The mantle is plastic. It's moving. It's flowing. Um, so is the outer core. The outer core is actually slightly more liquid. The inner core is solid metal. Um, we so we have. Um, it's going to behave differently because of these layers, and it's hot. So the core is 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 hot, and the crust is cool. So you have thermal gradients. The moon is not like that. The moon is is too small. To have plate tectonics, it's too too small to have retained the heat from its formation. So it is a big honking cold rock. It's solid all the way through. So it's much easier to drop something on it and cause it to vibrate than than the Earth. Gotcha. Did that, did that make sense? No, that makes perfect sense. Okay. No, no, that that makes that makes perfect sense to me. I'm able to understand that. Okay, good. Yeah. So now I, I can intelligently go and argue with those, <laughs> and then hear hear them shoot me down on some other theory, and we'll go back and forth. You know, that's the that's the beauty of this is that uh, you know you have always two sides, and I think that's what we try to do here. I want to present. I don't want to present one side. You know, I want to present both sides and I'll let people come up with their own. I guess the whole idea, my goal is to have people do their own research and then, and then dig into the science themselves and stop believing everything yes. that people tell you. Go out yes. there. And, you know, life is supposed to be lived. And if that means if that means you spend the next five years in the library learning about orbital, orbital mechanics and, and everything, think about how much you're when you come out of that experience, how the wealth of knowledge that you've gained. And and so I mean it's all part of living. Don't just yes. sit back and watch a video and or or go to and read a website and say, Oh, that's it. Do you know, do your own research. Do your own I you know, it's funny. We've become lazy and this is I'm gonna rant about this. I had a guy on Facebook, I did a show. He goes, It's a four this is the guy actually said he goes, It's a four hour show. Can someone go out there and and watch it and listen listen to it for me and then let me know if it's worth me listening to? Yeah. I'm like, dude, uh, yeah. why don't you get off your butt? Well, how about this? While you're sitting on your butt, why don't you turn on the show and listen for yourself? Yep. <laughs> you know? Well, you know, I'm, I'm amazed at the number of people that want me to do their Google searches for them. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I I'm, like, I'm not doing your homework. I tell them all the time, I'm not doing your homework for you. Go out to Google, do it yourself. Yep. All right, so you've been gracious enough to answer all my questions. And, uh, you know, if anybody out there in the chat room or in, in Facebook or on the uh, YouTube chat, if you have any questions for Stephanie Osborne, this is the time to get it to get it in. And we will, uh, you know, ask them, and then we're going to turn it over to Stephanie. It's going to be Stephanie's uh, time at that. Uh, I, I, oh, here's a question that just came in from Jeremy. Uh, what does your guest think of all of the MI underscore lab whistleblowers that have come to light in the last few years? Anthony uh, Sanchez and et cetera. Uh, yeah, he's going to have to explain himself. What, yeah, MI I, lab? MI I lab. I'm, yeah, I don't understand what the MI lab is either myself. Uh, it, unless, unless he's referring to a British something or other, and I don't keep up with that. Yeah. So, Jeremy, why don't you expand? Expand the question, uh, and and we'll we'll definitely ask that. I'm sure he will. Uh, Jeremy's a pretty good. And, and it, it may come back that I don't know what he's talking about. Even so, you yeah. know, cause, yeah. You know, I, I I keep up with. There's so much information out there. I'm doing good to keep up with 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 my fields, and I have many fields. Yeah. So I'm I'm I even struggle just to keep up with my fields. What so. Yeah, I mean, let's talk about that. So a lot of people that don't know, uh, a lot of people that don't know, let's talk about your field. I mean, you you hold a, a graduate and undergraduate degrees in four sciences, astronomy, physics, chemistry, and mathematics. Correct. And uh, and so you're also I, fluent in several in, in geology and uh, autonomy. Or what anatomy? Ana anatomy, anatomy, yes. anatomy. So you're you're an autonomous. <laughs> no anatomy. <laughs> it's getting late. I need to drink me another Jimmy Horton's coffee here. So yes, guys. So when so when I ask Stephanie about uh, orbital mechanics and stuff, she is one that you can't ask. <laughs> she's just not yeah. a she's just not a rocket scientist. <laughs> well, yeah, uh, actually, I can be considered a rocket scientist. So, um, but. Yeah, it's and that's why I can also talk about you know why the the moon rings, right. yeah, and, you know, because it's a geology thing. Yeah, the geology. Uh, uh, I, I did when I was in uh, in undergraduate school. A part of my my geology training, I actually did a paper on Martian Aeolian ge uh, geophysics, which Aeolian is the the Latin word means wind blown. So I was looking at the behavior of the sand dunes on Mars, and uh, I, I came up with some interesting things. I made some recommendations. Nobody paid any attention because I was an undergraduate. Yeah. But you know, so I've I've done a lot of of stuff in a lot of different fields, yeah. um, and and uh, you know, it's it's kind of funny. We'll go back to Star Trek for a second. Um. I always wanted to be like Mr. Spock. I didn't stop to think until just a few years ago that I pretty much succeeded in a lot of ways. Uh, it was it was not intentional. Um, I started off, I, I knew I wanted to go into astronomy and space science. But I also knew that that was generally a specialty that came in graduate school. Yeah. So I looked and I said, what can I study that will prepare me for that? And I said, physics. So I decided I would get a degree in physics. So then I started looking and I said, well, you can't hardly get a degree in physics without also getting a degree in mathematics. So that's where that came in. Yep. And then I, I started taking, I said, well, you know, there's a lot of chemistry involved in certain branches of astronomy. You know, if you're looking at the... Um, the spectrum of a star, you're, what you're really looking at are what chemical elements are in that star. If the star is cool enough, it may actually have a few basic molecules in it. Um, so then I started studying chemistry. And the next thing I knew, it was kind of like, well, if I only take a couple more classes, I've got a degree in chemistry. And, yeah, it just kind of built from there. So. Yeah. I mean, knowledge builds upon knowledge. It builds upon knowledge. And that's the way it should be. I mean, well, it's, you know, it was really funny because when I was taking, when I was, uh, do, I, I have an undergraduate minor in geology and a graduate subspecialty in geology. And so when I was taking my classes in um, seismology, uh, I had already taken 
my physics classes in optics. And really all seismology is is optics. It's it's a it's just instead of having light waves, you're looking at sound waves hmm. or acoustic waves. Um, and they behave the same. They reflect. They refract. They you know they're pol- so they polarize. And so the seismology was a piece of cake after having gone through a year of optics. So and everybody was like, "How is it that you're getting this so fast?" And I'm like, "Because I've already had it." But you haven't taken this course, no. But I've had one just like it. Yeah. So yeah. you know, it was that. That's you know. Uh, so yeah, it does. It builds on on itself. Yeah. So. Well, that's exactly what happened with me. It, with, you know, when I went to college, it, everybody was was like, "Well, why don't?" Because it, I, I was I was writing software when I was a kid. And everybody's like, well, why don't you take a computer science class? And it's like, well, I already took the Cobalt class because my brother, <laughs> you know, the yeah. Pascal class and the 4chan class because my brother. And so I wanted to go to college. And so my first year, it was funny, my first year was actually theater. And, and because I wanted to learn how to communicate, to talk, to speak. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, naturally. And then I thought I was going to do radio and, that failed miserably because I couldn't speak or pronounce the uh, artists, the jazz artists' names correctly. And oh. you don't go to a school, a university that's known for its music program and not be able to speak the artists' names uh, correctly. I mean, the professors, like I said, there yeah. were professors that did dissertations on these on these jazz performers, and uh, you know these were eclectic jazz performers. This was not like Louis Armstrong or anything like this. These were people that were foreign jazz players. So on top of that, they you know, they had strange pronunciations as well. So, so that ended up for me, but then I, I said, okay, I uncle, I went back into computer science, but of course, then it was like, well, this is boring for me. So I like you math and physics and, and chemistry. And that mm-hmm. was my, that was my background. And, and now then, my, my, my dad was a computer programmer and systems analyst. And he was he was in it during in the early days of computers. Yeah. And uh, you know when I was in elementary school, I w- you know the kids were like the the teachers started introducing decimal notation, yeah. Yeah. and they're like, "What's that?" <laughs> What's that? Yeah. I was already counting in binary, octal, and hexadecimal. Yeah, yeah. So you know I I was expl- helping explain to the other kids what. Anyway, uh, yeah, I, well, we, I took. We I did took, that. We had shirts. You know, it's funny you say that, but in high school, we had mm-hmm. shirts that were in, in hex, and we had shirts. We had slogans and stuff that were because they could. Our teachers could never tell what it is, and and most yeah, uh-huh. of the, and the teachers that could tell thought it was funny, so they didn't say anything. But right. we we actually wrote shirts out in binary and hex and and ASCII, and they had had no idea. I do want to address something, Debbie. In Facebook, I want to let you know, we do see, we see, I see your comments, but no one, because there's no link between Facebook and YouTube, the other people on YouTube don't see your comments. And like I said, I think Facebook is a great tool, but you're kind of on an island all by yourself if you want to get chat. If you really want to participate in the chat of the of our system, you really need to go over to YouTube and you need to get on the YouTube chat there. Uh, sorry, Stephanie, I, I, we have a, I have a listener who's complaining because no one's talking to her in chat. It's like, oh, because you're on an island on yourself and Facebook, all the, all the cool kids and Debbie, you can join the cool kids are over in YouTube. <laughs> so join <laughs> us in YouTube uh, and we're easy to find. Just type in the midnight ocean. We're the first link that comes up, but we'd love to have you there. Um, all right. So sorry to sorry to cut you off, but yeah, no, we did we did everything in in hex and and all of that. Uh, I yeah, do- I, I I was gonna get I was gonna get an undergraduate minor in programming and yeah. computer science, but they were they were still insisting that I take assembler. Yeah, and I I knew that that was old hat, and so I didn't want to waste my time. Oh really? So you I, I took. Hmm? You don't want to do assembly. 
<laughs> no. A machine. My, my, my dad was like, don't. Don't do it. Mm-hmm. It, it. We had so. to build our own PDF. We had to build our own circuits. That I I took assembly, and then we took machine, and and those were the esoteric classes actually at the university I was at, and we actually had to build our own uh, PL uh, our own devices. It was it was cool. I enjoyed it. That's probably a good thing I didn't take it then because yeah. I'm really not good at stuff like oh, that. Oh really? Yeah. I mean. Yeah. I, it, I don't. I don't build stuff. Well, yeah, building mm-hmm. logic, physical logic gates, and stuff like that. I mean, not not the programming logic gates, but actual building fi- physical logic right. gates. Right. Yeah, it was that was a good time. I was going to ask you, uh, Jeremy wanted to know if you if you ever heard of a gentleman named Gary McKinnon, M C K I N N O N. Um, where would I have encountered no, him? I don't know. I, I yeah. I, well, yeah, I, no, offhand it doesn't it doesn't yeah. ring a bell. But unless you unless you give me given my background, background yeah. unless you give me some sort of a specific location where I might have encountered him, you know, would I have encountered him at at Johnson Space Center? What have I would I have encountered him in graduate school? What I've encountered him here in Huntsville? You know, yeah. Uh, Chances are I'm not going to be able to find a face in my mind palace. Yeah, no, I, I, I think what I probably need to do, and this is kind of unfair to you, is let our listeners know that, that Stephanie, guys, Stephanie does not deal in the esoteric. Uh, she is a space, nuclear science, geography, astronomy uh, expert. I don't think she really deals that much in the esoteric uh, realm or the esoteric r- realm. And uh, she's not not a typical guest that we have here, but I think it's interesting because there's nothing wrong with bringing hard science to the conversation to bear. So I, I would like to say, or, have, you're, you're having said that, I'm not averse to a lot of this stuff. I actually, in addition to all the other stuff, I'm also a licensed Christian minister. I do believe that there's more out there than what we can touch sure. and see and but i my my training as a scientist uh tends to make me a skeptic mm-hmm. i'm not i'm not a hardcore skeptic but i'm going to if you say such and such is is true i'm going to say show me yeah i want to put my hands on it yeah and it, and if you can't if you cannot demonstrate that to me then i'm going to say as far as I'm concerned, it's not real or the jury's out. Yeah. You know, now if there's enough anecdotal evidence, I'm probably going to say the jury's out rather than it's not real. Uh, but so I'm, I'm not averse to some of this stuff. Some of it, though, is just a little, you know, I know we went to the moon. <laughs> we, we can demonstrate it. We can prove it. I know that the Earth is not flat. We can demonstrate it. We can prove it. Things like that. No, 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 no. Don't, don't, don't even go there. Yeah, there's, there's but, some things that are insulting. <laughs> but, 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 hey, you know, I'm, I'm game for if you can demonstrate to me that we have aliens visiting. I'm, I'm interested in that. Uh, well, so you know, even like I said, even those that are in the esoteric field who've made a living in the esoteric field. Have come out and and said that, and they're like me. They have the same same belief um, that they want to believe, but until they put their hands on it and they believe the people who who are talking to them, because um, who are we to doubt it? It's kind of like me. Who am I to doubt you if you say this happened to you and you believe it? Then I'm gonna. I believe yeah. you. I might not believe your story, but I believe that you believe it. Yes, and, and but I, well said. I well as, said. as a scientist, I have to. And, and Brad and I, we were joking about this on the show, and I think we offended a few people one time. Uh, you know, Brad's known in the in the in the community, and he's going to be on. We're going to do a tape because we're doing a show together uh, this weekend. And he, him and I both said the same thing: unless we can put our hands on it and fly the sucker, then we'll go. We'll agree with you. You know, but until yeah. then, it's kind of like, eh, you know, we want to believe. That's what it is. We want to believe. You. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, I get you. Uh, you know, uh, I just, I have to, 
you know, I, I'm really digging this Facebook, live Facebook, but it's becoming a real pain in my butt. <laughs> I'm sorry. We got people over there in Facebook, and apparently Facebook's like, oh, there's only an hour or only five minutes left of the show. It's like, no, no, we go on another, uh, you know, we're, we're on for another hour. <laughs> you know, I can't say this again. I'm, I'm going to say this one more time to everybody over there in Facebook as we speak with our special guests. I'm not going to take up any more of her time over this conversation, people. Do your homework. If you want to join us, I think YouTube is the best place for you. <laughs> Get over to YouTube and uh, because that's what they do, and we won't have all these audio questions. So, Stephanie, let's do this. Let's take a four-minute break. We're going to come back, and the last hour is all yours, and we, oh, won't, we won't break for that uh, for the last hour. So we'll have all that. So we're speaking with our very special guest, Stephanie Osborne, and like I said, we're going to take a four-minute break here. And then when we get back, it's going to be Stephanie's turn. She can ask questions. She can talk about her books, talk about what she's doing, uh, what she's not doing. You know, it's, it's her hour, guys. That's, that's the, that's the way we work around here. So you're listening to the Midnight Ocean Radio Show and the podcast. Give us about four minutes and we will be back with our very special guest, Stephanie Osborne.
Midnight Ocean with Jeff Norton on the Paranormal State Radio Network. That's right, Andrew. This is the Midnight Ocean Radio Show and a podcast. If you have a question for our guest, a legitimate question, Jeremy. <laughs> Jeremy, Jeremy wanted to know. He wanted to wanted me to ask our guest, Stephanie. Why didn't the space shuttle make a victory lap around the moon? I, you know, it's called logistics, man. <laughs> it's called logistics. I don't think people understand how much stuff we had to shoot up into the orbit to support the the lunar, uh, the Apollo missions. All of the support crafts and things that were up there. Maybe we can ask Stephanie that, but I did promise that it was going to be her hour and not not our hour so but yeah it would have been cool i think it would have been cool jeremy i agree with you and you know i gotta tell people uh, that's why as we bring stephanie back on the air that's why if you haven't gone out and purchased there's a great game it's called kerbal space i love that game I, I, stephanie you ever played kerbal space uh, I have not. I, I keep people keep telling me that I should, and I just haven't it, just haven't gotten around to it. It is so fun. It is so. I've landed on the moon. I got pictures of, of my little space guy <laughs> sitting next to Neil Armstrong's black and 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 everything. Maybe I'll, I'll I'll shoot that up here for the guys on YouTube. I, I actually it was wild. They said that was rare because uh, apparently Kerbal Space is written by a bunch of Russian space scientists and the the. You know, the science is real science. It, you yes. you have to orbit. You got to do burns. You have to. And it is it is not easy. And I the first time I ever landed on, on the moon, uh, I actually landed right next to Neil Armstrong's plaque <laughs> on the moon that they put on there for him. <laughs> so that's it. But, you know, you can answer the question. I think I answered it. Logistics. I mean, the orbit, the, the oh. space shuttle is just not designed to go around the moon. Well, no, it's not, and it does. It does not have the the the. When we go to the moon, we are leaving the gravity well of Earth. Yeah. And the shuttle simply does not have sufficient thrust to leave Earth's gravity well. We cannot break out of low Earth or low Earth orbit with the shuttle, which is why I find the science fiction movies where they send it off to intercept a comet and junk like that to be laughable. See, I, I it makes perfect sense. I always knew, you know, the resources, you know, that it it, it takes. But you're right, the fuel to be able to break the earth. Well, I, I should have known that from Kerbal because as many times it, as I crashed, yeah, it doesn't even have enough engines. I mean, I mean, the engines, the space shuttle main engines, it has three, and none of them have the the equivalent thrust to the main engines on the first stage of a Saturn V. Which had five engines, so it doesn't come close. Makes makes sense. You know that was one thing too. I I don't know if you saw that one just the other day, not just the other day, but we had the uh, the uh, Delta. Well, before the 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 SpaceX blew up, the rocket just before that was a Delta V rocket, and they said that was the fastest launch that they've ever experienced. And which tells me that they had way too much power uh, oh, yeah. uh, than than that than that the, they had they needed. had more they had more thrust than they had payload than they had payload and they were talking because they were like well it's a heavy you know they're they're shooting with a delta v which is the heaviest rocket combination that we have they're like well the payload must be huge and and, and then of course the conspiracy came out and I said well if I'm a scientist or if I'm a spy. And I'm sitting there and I'm trying to calculate what they're shooting up in space because this was a military mission. You know, I'm thinking they're going to shoot up a huge payload based upon the Delta V. But then I see that thing scream off. Then that tells me that that my calculations or what I thought they were shooting up is completely bunk. You know, we, yep. we have no idea. They they masked it. Basically, they masked But that thing, I mean, it, it was wild. Even the commentator was like, that was a fast launch. They've never seen anything move that fast. Um so I, I don't. I, yeah, we'll see. All right, as promised, what are you doing these? I know you're writing fiction. I am, uh, and writing a lot of it. 
Um, I have uh, uh, I've just had a new book released. I've got a, an ongoing series called the Displaced Detective series. Um, you you introduced me at the beginning of the show, which has been a few hours back now, <laughs> as the interstellar woman of mystery. Yes. Well, there's a reason for that. Um, a fan dubbed me with that. Uh, actually, it was it it started off as a as a podcast host. Uh, wanted to give me a nom de guerre, as it were. And so he came up with the International Woman of Mystery because I tend to write science fiction mysteries. And one of the, the fans in the chat room said, no, 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 that's Earth-based. She needs to be the interstellar woman of mystery. And it stuck. So I run with it. You know, it's kind of like that's my brand, so I go with it. But I do, I write science fiction mysteries. <clears throat> so the Displaced Detective series is a series starring Sherlock Holmes. It's been described as Sherlock Holmes meets the X-Files, which tells you the kind of mysteries he solves. Mm -hmm. And I yank him from an alternate realities Victorian era and dump him down into modern 21st century Colorado Springs. And he can't go back. So he has to stay here and learn to be a modern detective. This is not your father, Sherlock Holmes. So book six just came out. Um, the official re release date was actually today, but they started shipping it a few days early. It's called Fear in the French Quarter. And it is about um, an adventure that Holmes and Dr. Sky Chadwick Holmes, uh, who is from our reality, have in modern day New Orleans. And so it's, it's, I've had a lot of fun with the series. Um, it's, like I said, it's done. Uh, father Sherlock Holmes, and uh, it's this is book six, and I've got um, I've started on book seven. Book eight is actually finished, but needs some events in book seven to make sense, and I'm brainstorming book nine. So that that is <clears throat> that's been an ongoing thing. <clears throat> excuse me, it's hay fever season here in Huntsville. You'll just have to excuse me. Um, and then a, another publisher, different from the one who does The Displaced Detective, turned out was a fan of that series. And he approached me and he said, Steph, would you be willing to write some stuff, some Sherlock Holmes stories for me? Only I want you to do it traditional Victorian Holmes and Watson. So we brainstormed for an hour or two. And so we came up with the Sherlock Holmes Gentleman Aegis series, which is actually a prequel to the Displaced Detective series. So it's my version of Holmes in his original um, universe as a young man with Watson. And the first book in that series, Sherlock Holmes and the Mummy's Curse, came out last November. And I'm very, very pleased to say that it almost immediately became a pulp ebook bestseller. And this past summer, it won a Silver Falchion Award at the Killer Nashville Mystery Convention. So, um, and I've got at least one more, possibly two more books planned in that series. So, um, on top of that, this past summer, I started a new series. It's not published yet. I'm hoping the first book will come out the first of next year. Uh, <clears throat> but it's called the Division One series. Excuse me, let me try some water and see if I can yeah, get yeah, go, out. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you're probably not used to doing four-hour radio shows. I, 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 I'm i not, actually. I, I've done two hours before, but never never four. See, I, I have I have voice coaches. That's all they do is work with me during the day. <coughs> they keep my voice. You know, it's like a, uh, a – Yeah, so this is not – I should probably warn people who, who want to – that come on the air, it's like, yeah, you're going to – have water with you. Make sure you're very well hydrated, and and I do I, that. That's the key. Uh, I had I started off I started off the show with a with a half a gallon of water beside me. I'm down to about a third of that. <laughs> see, I started um, off with a half a half a gallon of uh, uh, Tim Hortons coffee, and I'm already out of that. Now I'm drinking tea. <laughs> oh, okay. So. Now, see, if I if I were to drink either one of those, I'd, my voice would probably actually be worse because the astringent effect. The the worst <laughs> thing you can ever do is drink caffeine in, in, in this yeah. business. I get I I don't want to get. How do I say it? I don't want to. When I look for my voice coach, my question 
that I asked them was, are you going to tell me I can't drink coffee? And, and it, the one that I hired, which she's very well known in, in the, in the industry, she goes, who am I to tell you what you can and cannot do? She goes, my job is to work with what you give me. And there I was you like, go. you're hired. <laughs> you're hired. But yeah, it does. It, yeah. Without training, it, it, it definitely takes its toll on you. And I, I do, I, I do empathize with you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, division one. Division one, I've, uh, what I've done with that, I'm, I'm having some fun with it. It is science fiction mystery, but it's a more, um, it's not quite urban fantasy. Um, and it's, it's, uh, there's a lot of action adventure. I took the concept of the, the, the urban legend of the guys that show up in the black suits and at UFO sightings and alien abductions and stuff and, and abscond with all of the the, the um, evidence and stuff. I, I took it back to its roots and decided to to spin my version of it. And um, and that that is Division One. So the first book uh, I've of the first four books in the series, three of them are actually done. A uh, one, three, and and four are are done, and I'm working on two. Hmm. Uh, so the first book is called Alpha and Omega. And it establishes the, 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 the background and, and takes us through our first, uh, series of adventures. And, um, the second book will be titled A Short Medium at Large. And the third book, um, I, I'm, I'm not happy with this title. It's a working title. I, I may wind up, I hope I'll wind up changing it to something that I like better. But right now it's called An Agency Christmas. And it's, 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 uh, imagine what happens if you combine aliens, men in black, a science fiction convention, and Christmas all in one package. That sounds like the circuit. <laughs> <laughs> that, sounds, that sounds like Manu's, that sounds like Manu and Arami's new pro- project called the circuit. And that's exactly what they're doing is you got to go out there and look at the circuit. These are all ex Star Trek guys and and uh, they have check off all the a lot of the ex Star Trek guys are doing this and that's exactly what they're doing. They're doing really obscure uh movies based upon their experiences the the circuit being the the you know the Comic Con Convin- convention, all, convention circuit, all, yes. and, and but then they're doing movies on like crazy things happen. That they, it's funny, they got the guy from Teen Wolf or whatever, not Teen, yeah, Teen mm-hmm. Wolf on MTV. And they're like, what happened if he was actually a werewolf? And, and it's hilarious. <laughs> the, you gotta, I mean, Manu's great. He's, he's going to be on the show here in a couple of, I'm going to, he's a good friend. So we're going to have him on the show again to talk about it. But it's that what you just, uh, you need to take that book because they're looking for submissions for screenplays. You need oh, to no. take that idea oh. and you need to send that to him because who but knows? This- I, I got an inside whole, track. This is a whole freaking series, though. Send it to him. These, these are these are these are the same characters recurring in these different adventures. So yeah, and and I'm and and so a short medium at large is uh, is the the characters. Uh, it turns out that Halloween is a big deal um, for for aliens. They they actually there's a huge tourist trade on Earth. For Halloween, because they can come to Earth, and they don't have to, they don't have to wear disguises. They can just go around as they are, and nobody said this. Hey, cool costume, man! Yeah. And and so and of course the other thing that happens at Halloween is that uh, you know Houdini died on Halloween, and so there's always a big séance. Yeah. At at his graveside, and so it's going to turn out that we're going to have um, an alien gray who happens to be a medium come to Earth because guess what? Houdini's non human. Oh. Ah. And so the, the, so the medium comes to Earth in order to contact Houdini and find out where a particular gadget is that his family had possession of because it needs to go back to the homeworld. 
um, only they don't want it to go back to the home world because it's going it's going to be that it, it will create this huge political infighting that could erupt into planetary civil war and even possibly spill over into more galactic matters and so they don't want that so then it becomes a, a, a kind of a a treasure hunt race to try to find the clues to locate this gizmo and so that's it. and and you know this and and I'm having fun with it oh my gosh it's like talk you want to talk about conspiracy theories and ufo stuff and all that it's like i watch the shows expressly to get ideas for this series yeah you, 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 you got to listen to this show <clears throat> because what you just talked about we had a guest on last week <laughs> that was talking about well, you know that we're getting to the point where we're going to have you know where where the where where the different species of aliens are you know they kept peace for a while there's a treaty but now the reptilians are getting a little upset they're getting out there and i don't want you know discount any of that but uh what you just described oh, is is you know we had a guest we talked about that last week the 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 uh the head of the Ennead, which is the the galactic council is a reptilian so yeah uh -huh. right, there you go so there is some there is some fact in your fiction oh well i didn't say that but uh, <laughs> <laughs> but i but i'm having it because i'm taking all of the i'm i'm looking for all of the different conspiracy theories and the tropes and stuff yeah. and 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 i'm trying to throw them in just for the fun of it you know I'm not saying I believe it. I'm not saying I don't believe it. But it it makes a heck of a good universe to write a story in, you know. Yeah. So I'm I'm having I'm having a wonderful time with it. I, y you have to understand. It takes a long. Normally, it takes a long time to write a novel. It takes a lot of energy to write a novel. Um, I mentioned word count versus page count earlier. Um, your average science fiction or mystery novel, the 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 word count range is it has to be at least eighty thousand words, and it's preferably no more than a hundred and twenty thousand, with an average right around ninety five or a hundred thousand words. So that's your average size novel. Um, it generally takes most uh. uh Exceptional authors can crank them out quickly. Most authors crank them out two to three a year. Um, I have so far this summer written three. So that what that says is that I'm I am really inspired by writing in this universe, and I'm really having a great time with it. Yeah. So, you know, Division 1 for me is, is – and Division 1 is the precinct, the galactic precinct that Earth is in. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm just having an immensely good time with it. I love the characters. I love the universe. It's something that I can throw humor into. It's something that I can throw pathos into, tension, drama, you know, it, the whole oh. gamut – of emotions if 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 some of the stuff that happens in some of these don't make you tear up there's something the matter with you <laughs> yeah. well, uh, if, uh, if other things don't make you laugh your head off there's so, something the matter so with you <laughs> i'm now i gotta ask do you treat your writing like a job like a nine to five like where you sit down you you commit eight hours a day or five hours a day to write or or or, or do you, or does it just come to you and you just happen to have a a computer or whatever uh, next you know, to you, and you just write it. It it's it's. I sit down virtually every day and write, mm. but it's hardly nine to five, and it's not an eight hour day at all. Um, I may start writing. I ha I I'm a night owl. Mm -hmm. I'm generally. Um, I will get up anywhere from ten to noon in the morning. And then I'm usually up until three or four in the morning. And I will, I will give myself a couple of hours to wake up and, you know, take my time, get some coffee, get something to eat, get dressed, 
and then and then I'll start writing. And I may start writing at, oh, let's just say two in the afternoon. If I'm really rolling, I will have to make myself stop and go to bed at 4 a.m. Hmm. Um, so, yeah, I mean, so we're talking, what's that, yeah. uh, 14 hours? I, I can see that. I mean, I can see that when I when I get into doing some of these things that I do. Well, when I when I used to write, well, I still write code. When when I develop code, or not as much as I used to, but when I wrote code, I would go two three days nonstop writing code easily. Yeah. All yeah, jacked and- up, as we joke around, all jacked up on Mountain Dew. Well, for us, it was Sun Drop. Yeah, we. Oh yeah. You uh-huh. know, Sun Drop. It was that was the. Sundrop was better than Mountain Dew. Yeah. yeah. Well, you learn, you learn, you love Sundrop until you have to, you know, you have kidney stones, and then you're like, ah, Sundrop. And then it's funny because I'm the only member of my family that's ever had issues with kidney stones, and so I talked to my doctor, and he's like, yeah, it's a Sundrop. <laughs> so it's oh. like, what? I, I'm, now, I'm, now I'm going to blow blow your mind because um, I do all that without caffeine. Wow. I'm no. I, I'm, I have several different medical conditions uh, that preclude my having caffeine. I'm sorry. Yeah, it sucks. But, um, you know, like I said, though, uh, four in the morning, and, and I actually have to be careful that I'm not, I, and I have lost track of time and been up all night and been still writing at sunrise. But, you know, my husband likes me to be able to do stuff with him once in a while. All right, Stephanie. So I, I, I kind of not need to not get on an opposite schedule. I'm, I'm going to stop you right there because you just said something that was very interesting. You lose track of time. Oh are, yeah. Are you are you sure you're writing these stories? I'm joking. Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure. I I lose track of time because I I immerse myself in that world. Um, and my my husband learned years ago that if I'm sitting at the computer writing. That uh, that he'd better make plenty of noise coming into the room, because if he came up behind me and laid a hand on my shoulder to ask me what I want for dinner, he's apt to be peeling me off the ceiling fan. You're in the you zone. Know, be- yeah, I'm in the zone. You're in the I'm, zone. I'm, I'm I'm not here. I'm there. I'm in the world I'm writing about, whatever wow. world that happens to be. Yeah, I mean that that was one thing that that I I am fascinated about. You know, writing and. And and I'm like you is that I I will actually visualize that world and then what yes. what I do is is when I wrote uh, as I was visualizing the world I was everything you know I was describing the trees the buildings the the sidewalk not only then having the conversations and uh, you know one of the things I just my problem is is I always find something that occupies me other than writing. Uh, oh. I I mean I mean my my day job number one I I still write code to fund the operation here for for a select few customers uh, uh you know I can have one or two that that whole thing about find one or two customers that make ninety percent of your income instead of ninety mm-hmm. customers that make you know one percent of your income so yeah uh, so I have the one or two and uh, so I'm grateful for that because I can kind of balance instead of getting hit every which direction. I can work on certain projects, but I mean, the radio show itself, obviously we got the four hours here, but a lot of people don't realize the six hours that we spend during the day, coordinating, getting new guests, shooting out emails, trying to schedule all that stuff. And, you know, I do it all myself. Oh yeah, Uh, I do. I do understand. (laughs) Yeah. So it's hard to write. Uh, And I do, I have a lot of ideas and someone said, well, why don't you grab one of your artists and do a ghostwrite thing? And because I have some pretty, pretty cool ideas. We did have a question that did come in and, and I actually, Jeremy gave me the background story on this one. So maybe we can, uh, Benjamin Rich from Lockheed Skunk Works. Okay. He, uh, he said, we have the text to take ET home. What, uh, 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 what did you, I mean, uh, what do you think? Do we have the technology to do interstellar? No. Because not not in our lifetime and not in E.T.'s lifetime unless E.T. is a lot longer alive than we are. 
Oh. Um, I'm, I'm familiar. See, the thing of it is, I'm familiar with the physics. Yeah. And so I understand how an Alcubierre drive uh, works or should work. And I understand what's required to, to generate. An Alcubierre drive is basically Star Trek's warp drive. Mm -hmm. And so I understand the physics and I understand why it would work and how it would work. And I know that as it stands right now, we do not have the material science to make it work. We do not have the material to make it work. It's going to require some exotic materials. Yeah. Uh, and, and by that, I'm talking like dark matter or something like that. I'm talking about something really, truly exotic. Yeah. And we don't have that. Yeah, on paper, we have it. And and you made the, you made the one point. No, we... We don't even have it on paper. We don't know for sure that dark matter is a thing. Oh. Yeah. That's right, because CERN still is... Uh, right. St Stern is still... And, you know, that the God particle, I think that they rescinded that just the other day, or, or not too long ago, where they came back the, and said, well, maybe Higgs we don't have the Higgs boson. Both I haven't heard about that if we did. Um, as far as I know, it's it's still a thing. I, yeah, I. this is my thing, and this is, how do I say this? I watched the special on CERN, and they were talking about and they and, and it was kind of like, it wasn't, it wasn't like, how do I say this? It wasn't like they said, this is it. It was at a, it was at an energy level that they, that was outside of what they were looking for. Yeah, and then they and, came and back and said, well, because this is, yeah, we found it. And it's like, well, no, wait a minute here. The science, the theoretical guys are saying it's supposed to be here. And then you guys, the, 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 you know, the, the physical guys over here are saying, well, it's here. And thus we found it. it's like, no, wait a minute. You, you can't fix the model to, to, you know, to justify what you guys are doing over at CERN, which, right. which, by the way, and that that's a. I want to get your opinion. You ever heard of a the the uh, Mandela effect? Um. All right. So I'm going to stop not, your. No, it's not. It's not ringing a bell. But okay. that does I want to stop I might not have heard of it under some other have name. Have you ever watched a movie or a, a TV series on HBO called Sex? And I'm not going. I'm going to stop the the name of it. But it was it was it was a about women in New York. Uh, yeah. Um, okay, I'm looking up Mandela effect. Well, don't look it up. I want to ask you a couple. Well, better yet. So, Sex in the City was the oh, name. Oh, the uh, parallel universe. The, yes, yes, yes. I know what you're well, talking about. I, I wanted, well, I wanted. I didn't want to throw you off. Uh, Oscar. I'm going to want you to finish this one. Oscar the the baloney. Oscar Meyer. Meyer. Yeah. Look it up. Yeah, the Mandela effect is basically CERN opened up a, a, a parallel to us and it's bleeding over to this universe. What we used to know, it's not Oscar Mayer, it never was. Well, to me, it was always Oscar Mayer. I remember singing a song, a lot of people, but it's Oscar Mayer. Bernstein Bear, Bernstein Bear. There, what it is, is that... Well, the, it's pronunciation. Well, no, it's spelling. Look at the spelling of the Oscar... They. Oscar, if you go to Oscar, it's Oscar Mayer, and they yeah. they swear to God, it's always been Oscar Mayer. Well, there's video and there's pictures of people with Oscar Mayer uh, packaging in the background, and yeah. and everybody's like, oh, that's just you know, it's it's just no. And it, like I said, you know, Sex in the City is a great. That was an HBO series. I used to watch that religiously with my friends in Chicago. We'd have parties. And now it's sex and the city. And they, so there's a lot of little shifts, little nuances, not a whole lot, but enough to shift. And it, it's the whole, I was going to ask you, and, you know, the theory is that CERN, CERN caused that by doing what they were doing. I don't yeah, know. well, no, it's, it's no, no, <laughs> just no. Yeah. Just <laughs> you know, no. Oh, man. I was hoping I was going to suck you into our world a little bit there, Stephanie. <laughs> well, yeah, but. 
You, you, That's right. Yeah, you're. I know. And, and like I said, I gave out that warning to all the everybody in chat that you are hard science. And so, but look into it. Look into it. Well, it it's crazy. You know, I, 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 yeah, I get it. But I mean, just no. <laughs> but you said Oscar <laughs> Mayer. The thing of it is, I, I, I write about alternate realities all the time. Yeah. So, but. But you don't believe I, in them. I I do actually, oh, okay. but not like that. Oh. Okay, but you said you said it was Oscar Mayer. Why why is it Mayer now? Because most people don't know how to pronounce what's no, written in front the, of them. No, it's it's the spelling. <laughs> no, yeah. it's the spelling. Go out there, do some research on the Mandela effect, and then we'll talk off. It is. I'm like you though. I'm a hard science guy. I mean, it. it you know, you're talking to a guy who, who I don't have a problem telling guys like Brad Olson. I don't, I don't believe in this or that until I put my hands on it. And he agreed with me, which, which blew me away. Uh, I want to believe that you believe, yeah, I believe that you believe and, and stuff, but it, until I put my hands on it and I've seen, uh, I put, you know, infrared gen threes on and looked up at the night sky and seen things flying around that I'm, I can't explain, but that doesn't mean that, it, you know, well, it is a UFO because I don't know what it is, but. I we I've come to the conclusion that 80 90 percent of what we see or what we think we see is some military it, you know it's definitely military in nature um, and that's probably true yeah I mean that we we've been playing around with drones uh, you know you've got to remember what you see there's 10 years of technology in front of that that you don't see yet so if you're seeing drones for the first time flying around and and you know and you know the the limiting factor. You know this is aerospace. The limiting factor has always been the pilot. Oh yeah. In in, in any so craft. It, yeah. So if if it's something that the pilot can't withstand, then yeah, yeah, they build airplanes around the pilot. Yeah. So so that's the that's that's the thing. It's always been built that way. And and so and it has to be built that way. Yeah, yeah. Because who's going to fly? But now you have drones. Now you can turn ninety degrees. Now you're well. Now your limitations, no, your no. material. Yeah, you're you're limited to your material. Yeah. And you're you're limited to what physics will do. Yeah. Because you still have inertia. Yeah, you, you you're right. You still. But that was the other thing too. Is that one of the things that I got to see at UTSI was where they were testing ceramics, different types of material to handle you know friction and 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 some exotic materials. I got to see some of the ceramic research that they were doing, which is pretty, and this is back in the early nineties. So you can only imagine where we're at today with, with ceramic and, and some oh, yeah. of the exotic materials that we've developed or that we are developing. Yeah. That was, I actually used a little bit of that in a, in one of my displaced detective books. So, Right. But if I explain it to you, I will give away the book. No, you got to buy the book. And I yeah. want to tell everybody, if, if you guys want, I mean, obviously we have links to Stephanie's website, but all of all of your books are listed on themidnightocean.com under your author, off, you have an author's page, a guest page. And so they can also link from there and, and purchase your books. What? So if I was to buy a book, if I was to... The the quintessential Stephanie Osborne book. If I was to buy one of them, because I have been out to Amazon and see all of your books are four star or above. Most of them are four and a half star and above uh, ranking. But if I could buy one that would introduce me to you as a writer, what book would you recommend? Oh, that's that's like asking a parent. To name a favorite child. We all have our favorite children. No, we shouldn't. <laughs> well, that's what Dr. Uh, Phil says, but <clears throat> it, it depends on the time of day. <laughs> so as of today <laughs> and at 2 o'clock or whatever in the morning, what is your favorite child? <laughs> well, it, um, geez, um, it depends. It, your readers would probably find... My my first book, Burnout, interesting. They would probably enjoy the Displaced Detective series. Um, they would probably enjoy uh, Gentleman Aegis, which is the prequel. Um, and they would probably, it's not out yet, but they're probably going to get a really big kick out of my Division 1 series. 
So those those would be, I think, what I would recommend right now. Okay. To the people that are listening. So. All right. Yeah, I'm definitely going to get your STS one. Yeah. Okay. Definitely. That, that's on my list. I'm going to get them all eventually, but because uh, I'm an avid reader. When I'm not, that's that's the thing. When I when I do go on vacation, I I carry a ton of books with me, and uh, I, I haven't really. I tried the ebook thing. Eh, I like books. I like hard books in my hand. I'm 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 a little of both. Yeah. Um, I, I like I don't have a a Kindle as such, but I've got a Kindle app on my Droid, and uh, and I I've got that thing loaded down because yeah. it's really nice when I'm traveling. Yeah, you know, I, I get get insomnia. I'm in a strange hotel bed and I can't sleep, so I get up in the middle of the night and I read. Yeah, you know, so, I'm starting to get into audio. Do you have any of your books in audio form yet? Uh, not yet. I'm working on it. Um, I, I'm 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 having a hard time finding um, a voice talent that I want to use, and I've been told I should do it myself. But you can hear in my voice why I haven't done so yet. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I'm I'm actually kind of surprised that I lasted as long as I did before I started to croak. <laughs> That's it, but. but- uh, well, like I like I always do, I know it's getting long into the night and we're running out of time. Is there anything that you would like to cover that we did not cover? Well, um, for those that are listening as opposed to watching, um, everything that I've got is available on Amazon. Most of it is available in print and ebook. Some of it is available only as ebook. My website is www.stephanie-osborne.com. That's Osborne spelled with as few letters as possible, O-S-B-O-R-N. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Twitter. I'm also on um, Google Plus and a few other places, but I'm mostly on Facebook and Twitter. Yeah, yeah. And, and we, like I said, I don't have your Facebook link, but I do have links to your website on your okay. author's page. And, if you know, obviously... For those that are listening, if you go out to the midnightocean.com, you can always click on Stephanie Osborne's name. You can search O S B O R N, or, you know, if you want to do it in a week or so, you can do that. We also just included a guest page, which lists all of our guests and the dates that they were on the show. And you can click on there. And of course, that will carry you over to Stephanie's um, website. And then also all of her books that I could find on Amazon. Uh, are listed on the website as well, and you can purchase them right from the website. We don't upcharge. It's the same price on our website as it is on Amazon. And um, more, you know, if we would. But I see a couple of them are only digital only. Yes. Yeah. There are, there are a few things that um, that are either too big or too small to put into print. Gotcha. So there's, there's the the first four books of the Displaced Detective series are con, con, uh, compiled into an omnibus. That's ebook only because it would be such a honking big book you couldn't carry it around. Yeah. Um, and then you know, some I've got some short stories and things like that up, and those are ebook only because they're not big enough to print. I'm looking at uh, compiling an anthology of some of my shorter works so that I can print them. Wow! Wow! Yeah, I love your I love your website. You said your husband did that. Awesome. Well, my I I do I do my own website. Um, I I learned to code HTML expressly so I could build my own website. But he does um, most of the graphics for it. Gotcha. So most of those book covers that you're looking at on my website uh, are his work. Is his work okay? Not not all, but most of them. Cool. Cool. Well, once again. We've gotten to that point where we got to say goodbye. <laughs> Aww. So, I know. I know. I know you can go another four hours. <laughs> I don't think my voice can, though. <laughs> as It's funny because as the conspiracy theorists start showing up on the website now, you know, in the, in the morning, and, and, you know, we're talking, they're talking about the hurricane. We've got a major hurricane, as you know, that are coming next to us. Mm-hmm. And uh, so now they're telling us, that it's going to hit inland, and, and then I hope it hit, I how do I say this? My brother is down right where it's coming across, and, oh, then, and then my in-laws are actually on, they're at Ormond Beach, which is Daytona Beach, but they're on the outer island, 
right off of there. So they've already shut down the bridges. So they're not allowing anybody to to go on to Ormond Beach. Uh, they'll allow people to evacuate uh, because they're worried about theft and, yeah. and looting and stuff. So it's, well, I've got I've got a bunch of friends that live in various parts of Florida. I've got friends in West Palm. Yeah. Uh, and, and I, um, a friend of mine notified me they're worried about the, uh, the, um, yeah, they're worried about Kennedy Space Center. Yeah. Be- because of the possibility that, for 130 to 140 that, mile an hour winds. That's right where it's coming. It's going to hit right there. My brother lives right down, and that's exactly where it's going to come if oh, it makes right. landfall. That's yeah, where it's going to and and the the historic buildings like the VAB and the Launch Control Center and stuff like that, they're not designed for that high winds. Yeah, they're not. Yeah, it, it, and that'll that'll be bad. Yeah, no, it, it well, and I hate to say it, the uh, I hope it hits landfall because now they're saying that if it doesn't make landfall, it's going to go up to North Carolina, hook back around, and then come back in again. Yeah, I saw that. I've, so, I've been keeping up with it. Yeah, you know, storm storm spotter here. Yeah, so we're, I, I'm not I'm not a storm chaser, but I keep up with this. Yeah, stuff. well, we got hit. You know, we actually got about 20 miles north is where uh, of us is where the main Hermes hit. And yeah, you know, I told people. I mean, I got friends that live right on the Gulf, and they said it was a, they got the storm surge all wrong. You know, they had nine, nine to 12 feet. So I tell people, I'm like, stand in your, in your house. That's eight and a half feet. And then go a couple more feet above that. And then on top of that, add a couple more feet for waves. Yeah. And that's, that's the wall of water that was coming at these people. Well, I've, I've been through hurricanes in Florida before and it's no fun. Yeah. And when, when Katrina hit, um, you know, we're, Huntsville, Alabama is on the opposite end of the state from the Gulf Coast. Yeah. But, and, oh. and, and they always, as soon as the eye comes inland, they immediately downgrade it to a tropical storm or a tropical yeah. depression. They should not do that because that sucker will still pack in at least category two winds when the eye tracked directly over us. Yep. Oh, yeah. So, so yeah, it, there- it and, and, we took damage. There's there was a gash, eight inch long gash, clear through the enamel into the metal of my husband's car. Yeah. No, I, from who what? Yeah, you know, well, they're already telling us that even though we're on the on the west coast, they're they they've already told us number one, uh, expect power outage. If you have your power out because we're not primary. So all of the electric crews are on the east side of the coast, so we're going to get power back. They actually, we went three days without power, but they're already telling us to expect go a week without power over here because if they lose power, because all the crews are moving that direction for the east coast, yeah, right. and it's gonna they're going to set them up before they move them back to us, number one. And number two, they're telling us to expect anywhere from 40 to 70 mile an hour winds here. Stay safe. Yeah, we're gonna we're we're gonna. Hang. I mean, thank God we're in a modern house. All of the other houses around us are are the old old Southern homes, and uh-huh. um, yeah, but we we're our house was only built about seven years ago, so it's the it's the concrete cinder block, and then every every six feet there's a, a pillar of concrete poured, and uh, so now the house is it, it's just it's you know we got nailed last time. We went three or four days. Without power, we were woefully unprepared, and I can tell you, I, I don't have my generator yet, uh, but uh, we have made preparations this time. We, you know, we were we're ready to go, and I think what's going to be nice this time around is that it's only going to be in the seventies um, versus last time when Hermes hit us. We were in the ninety ninety eight degree with ninety eight percent humidity, and with yeah. no air conditioning, it was brutal. It was brutal, but uh, yeah, I'm wor- more worried. Like I said, my brother. It was funny. I called my brother today, and I'm like, "What? You know, if you need a place to stay, come on up." And he goes, "No, we put the storms. Everything's locked down. All the trucks and cars or neighbors have cleared out their garages or whatever, so they're all kind of like putting their vehicles in the garages." And I'm like, "Well, what are you going to do?" He's like, oh, "I'm working on a tile project. I got to retile the bathroom." <laughs> oh, good. Grief. So he goes, okay. "Why everybody else is at Home well- Depot getting supplies? Because he's already got his generator." He's like, yeah, I'm buying tile stuff because my wife, you know, Linda wants me to 
Uh, yeah. The, well, the as long as he's, as long as y'all are both away from the from the possibility of storm surge, yeah, well, I guess that's okay. My in-laws though, are, they're on the outer island, so they're on Ormond yeah. Beach. On yeah. the out, so they're we told them don't mess around. They just need to come here because yep. they're actually below. If the way that the beach is set up, are you familiar with Daytona Beach, that area? I have been there, yes. So you it's have been a while. so you have the outer island that runs along and yeah. then and then they have a like a berm that's built up and that berm is only eight or nine feet uh high and then it, it slopes back down. And once the water bre- it's like a dike almost. Once the water breaches that berm, they're uh, they're getting flooded. I mean, yep. we, I told them, I'm like, you guys really kind of like the levees down in New Orleans. Yeah, yeah, you need to want, you know. I would just, I don't know, but of course, you got to worry nowadays about looting and all of that stuff. And yeah, I'm not worried about their structurally of their house being struck because it was built by the Corps of Engineers. It's just the whole, you know, if it breaches the the storm wall, there, they're they're in yeah. a world of hurt. But you know, pray for them. And, uh, oh yeah. Oh yeah. But yeah. So, oh Lord. All right. So once again, uh, Stephanie, I, I appreciate you coming on the show, sharing your Thank experience. You and, oh, it was, it was incredible. I learned a lot. I had a lot of questions well, that, good. that you answered, you know, on the science side. And of course we got to talk about your books and some of the things that you're doing in the future and, and everything. So I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I know that the the chat room is a buzz, and I they appreciate you coming on and saying another great show. So once again, sure. take care. I I will be in touch. I'll I'll shoot you an email in the, in the morning when we get up because you okay. get up about the same time I do. So okay, this <laughs> works. Right. Well, we keep the same schedule basically. That, so. Well, absolutely. <laughs> Except I, I I got a little I I squeeze in a little cat nap around five o'clock. I I sleep for about two hours or try to sleep for about ah, two hours okay. if the dogs will let me. <laughs> so that's, okay. a, that's about it but once again thank you very much and uh we'll be in touch all right thank you bye now so there you go stephanie osborne joining us I, I will have to tell you if you guys just came into the show you need to listen to the first two hours that was incredible she shared with us um about the you know her experience with the columbia and the challenger uh and then also the apollo one uh, and, and gave us some insight. I, I, I learned something like, you know, I knew that we had astronauts that died in Apollo one, but she actually explained how they died and, and the, and the engineering that led up to that, uh, tragedy and some other things. A great, uh, just very informative. And I appreciate her coming on and, and spending the time with us. And then, of course, answer some of the questions, the esoteric questions I know you guys wanted me to ask her from last night's show. But like always, guys, all, all things must come to an end. And I appreciate each and every one of you in the chat room uh, for joining us. And more importantly, I appreciate you guys being civil in the chat room. It looks like uh, it looks like those that want to cause trouble or feel the need to cause trouble have gotten the message pretty clearly. And it always takes one, right, to get booted for the rest of everybody else to take notice. And I do appreciate that and, and, and such. And if you are in Florida, my fellow Floridians, please be safe. Be safe. And be honest with you. I'm being honest with you. If you need a place to stay on the West Coast or whatever, please email me listener. It's listener dot the midnight ocean at gmail.com we'll make room for you it might be a tent or it might be whatever but we'll we'll make room for you uh here at the norton household because we we all have to stick together right like always as you guys know we always end the show with our good friend ed roman uh, i'll tell you ed is uh wish him luck on the eighth he is up for the uh indie artist of the year record he's got a record his album is up and also his song i am uh, I want to, well, hold on. I'm trying to think which one. It's not I Am Love, but it's Lay One Down. And you know what? I think we're going to play that one tonight as well as our on our exit song. And also, of course, we got to finish up with The Wolfman. 
But uh, be be well. I'm going to be staying on the chat room for a few minutes as the song is playing. So I'll uh, answer you some of your chat questions. But I just want to say thank you to our great guest who uh, joined us, uh, Stephanie Osborne. And uh, like like I said, get out to the artist or get out to the author page that we've created for her at the midnightocean dot com, and uh, you know check out one of her books. I'm I'm looking forward to it. I'm going to be getting the SDS book. Take care, and like always, as I said, be love. Take care, and like always, as I said, be love. I'm a